Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Antonio Vallasoler, and I'm analyst in the Nuclear Technology Development and Economics Division at the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency. Uh, it is my pleasure um, to welcome you to the NEA workshop on advanced construction and manufacturing methodologies for nuclear new build. Um, we had a of us uh, very exciting afternoons full of intense discussions. We have brought together academia, industry, regulators, and also uh, code and standards organization to provide you with a full picture of the potential of advanced construction and manufacturing techniques to reduce the cost of nuclear projects. All of this illustrated with specific examples and first-hand experience. Throughout the four sessions of this workshop, we will explore the opportunities and challenges associated with the adoption of advanced construction and manufacturing techniques, both in the short and longer run. In this sense, we will hear first about recent construction experience and techniques that are already being deployed, but also we will explore uh, new deployment pathways associated with uh, more innovative technologies such as SMR. Uh, further, uh, this workshop is an opportunity to provide you with insights on the processes to codify these uh, construction and manufacturing techniques. And we will also explore the role of regulators to enable the safe adoption of these techniques at a larger scale. Uh, each session today, we have between three, four presentations from distinguished speakers, followed by a panel discussion of, about, of around 30 minutes. And now without further delay, I'm pleased to introduce you two distinguished speakers that we provide you with some opening remarks. You will hear first from Mr. William Magwood Force. Mr. Magwood is the Director General of the Nuclear Energy Agency since 2014. Prior to this position, he served as one of the five commissioners of the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And he was also the Director of the Nuclear Energy at the US Department of Energy. The second distinguished speaker is Mr. Michel Heydra. Mr. Heydra is the Deputy Director General for Climate and Energy and Director for Energy Market and the Dutch Ministry of Economics, Affairs and Climate. In that capacity, he's responsible for the development of policies of the Dutch government on energy markets, on ensuring reliability and affordability of energy supply and on the road towards climate neutrality. Before that, he worked for 11 years at the Dutch Ministry of Finance in his last position as Deputy Treasurer General and Director for International Financial Affairs. So with this, uh, please, Director General Magwood, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Antonio, and welcome to all of you. It's a great pleasure to uh, open today's workshop on advanced construction and manufacturing technologies. This is a, a very important issue uh, that we face today. As you know, um, it has not been that long since we um, ended the conversations in Glasgow on COP26. And it was certainly my observation that as countries emerged from those conversations and focused on the need to reach net zero by the 2050 timeframe, more and more policymakers, more and more uh, industry leaders, um, and even members of the general public began to see that this task that society has set for itself is one that is going to be extraordinarily difficult to meet. Um, it is not going to be easy for us to turn our economies to net zero in, a, in such a short period of time. We've really never in the history of mankind done anything like this. So it's really a tremendous challenge. And it is certainly my impression that as we walked away from Glasgow and started to think, what should we be doing to make success possible? More and more countries realized that we were going to need every tool at our disposal to have um, the best chance to meet this, this goal. And among those tools, uh, certainly the construction of new nuclear power plants uh, became much more prominent in the conversation. As we face this, it's very clear that the nuclear sector has uh, some history to deal with. And the history in recent years in Western countries 
and building new nuclear power plants has not been very encouraging. We have seen significant um, cost overruns, uh, schedules being missed by a decade or more, um, and it's recognized throughout the sector and throughout society that this cannot be allowed to happen in the future. If, if nuclear can't be built on cost and on schedule at a reasonable price, then it, it will miss the opportunity to play a large role in the energy transition. And my belief is if nuclear fails to become a viable alternative for countries around the world because it can't afford or can't, can't afford the cost of the plants or can't take the risk on the overruns. Um, and this isn't really just a matter that nuclear will be left behind. It's a matter of failing in the energy transition. It's a matter of not reaching that zero. So it's essential that the lessons that have been learned over the course of time in building nuclear plants be fully absorbed by the industry, be fully absorbed by regulators, be fully absorbed by governments as we go forward. That was really um, a central theme of the report that we released late last year called Unlocking Reductions in the Cost of Nuclear, a Practical Guide for Stakeholders. Uh, this report went through a variety of issues facing the construction and deployment of new nuclear power plants. Among them, um, how to build them better and more in a more in a smarter way. There are other issues as well, such as digital transformation and other issues. But the issue of construction is one that, that many people um, and many analysts have been looking at. How do we build these plants more effectively? How do we make sure that we don't have these big cost overruns in the future? Um, how do we make sure that the economics of nuclear power are such that they are competitive and can be built as part of the energy transition? Um, that is what we are going to be talking about today. Um, the challenge to build these plants on cost and on schedule, and not just the current technology, but new nuclear plants, new SMRs and microreactors. Um, how do we learn, take all the lessons we've learned and to turn that into uh, practice. That is the challenge that we face today, and we'll be talking about that over the course of the next two days. Um, many of what we will face is, is the recognition that not only can we not build the plants that we've built in the past, but the infrastructures and environment around them have to change as well, including the regulatory environment. Uh, how do regulators deal with these new innovations? How do we advance the codes and standards to make sure that they're prepared for this new wave of construction? Um, many pieces have to come together the right way to be successful. But as I said, I think that success is essential because if we are not successful in finding answers to all these issues, um, the nuclear uh, will not be able to play the role that it should and is needed to play in order to help countries around the world meet this energy transition challenge. Um, one of the things that's been most gratifying about the recent conversations is the discussion about building new nuclear plants has really expanded dramatically uh, to many countries around the world. Uh, in the past, the conversation was relatively limited. Now it's expanded quite dramatically. And one of the areas of the world where the nuclear conversation has become uh, reignited, that I'm very pleased to see and very interested to see how it all progresses is Europe. Uh, for many years, the discussion in, in Western Europe has been very, very quiet when it comes to new nuclear construction. That's changing. Um, certainly, countries ranging from the UK to France have been talking about building plants for quite some time, but now other countries are looking at it as well, including um, the next speaker um, representing the Dutch government, um, his country is having a conversation. Now, I'm looking forward to Mr. Hager's remarks to see how he views this new nuclear construction period um, in the context of his country's climate policy. So um, I will hand the floor back to Antonio, but let me thank him for his efforts in putting this together and Deanne and the rest of her team, uh, Wendy and Nekatrina and others who contributed to this. Thank you for the efforts. And certainly we'll look forward to the outcomes of this webinar. Uh, enjoy the next couple of days and I'm looking forward to your conversation. Antonio. Thank you, Digimago, for uh, your kind words and also these opening remarks uh, highlighting the role of uh, new construction and advancement of factoring techniques to get the economics of nuclear right. Also, 
highlighting how timely is this discussion, especially for countries that are trying to expand or are planning for uh, new builds in the, in, the, in the future. So that's why we have here, and we are extremely delighted to, to have here with us Mr. Heydra to talk about recent new build plans in Netherlands. So please, uh, Mr. Heydra, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Antonio, and thank you, Mahmoud, uh, for the introductions. It's a real pleasure to participate in this, in this workshop. And as both of you say, it's, it's really timely against the background of, of COP27, uh, 26, uh, uh, and looking forward to, uh, to the renewed interest that we see in Europe, um, but we have seen it already in, uh, in this country. And let me tell you something uh, um, about how this renewed interest uh, gained traction in my country and what we are planning uh, uh, going forward. So first of all, um, uh, a brief introduction of how nuclear already plays a role in, in the Netherlands. Um, as you know, the Netherlands is uh, one of the smaller, but also one of the most densely populated areas in Europe, but actually of, of the whole world. Um, it's a country where one quarter of the uh, land is below sea level, so people are acutely aware of the risk of, 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 of climate uh, and flooding that might happen in the future. There's already a small nuclear uh, sector in the Netherlands. It's diverse. Uh, we have one major nuclear plant. We have two uh, uh, research reactors. Uh, we have a famous uh, uranium enrichment plant that I guess most of you know. Uh, and we also have a central national radioactive waste storage facility. Um, and in addition to that, um, one of our uh, um, uh, research reactors is the global market leader in, in producing medical isotopes. Uh, we always focus on, on energy, and there are also, of course, very important secondary nuclear products that play a key role in, uh, in, in global, uh, uh, global markets for, uh, for health. Um, so how did the renewed interest uh, in the Netherlands start in, in nuclear energy? Um, so first of all, we were uh, very acutely aware of the need to realize a CO2 reduction of 55% by 2030. That's a European goal. Um, uh, we lobbied for it uh, strongly, um, and therefore we have to take that uh, as a serious uh, basic condition that we need to achieve. In the Netherlands, compared to other countries, nuclear energy was never formally excluded as part of the energy mix. Uh, uh, our German neighbors uh, uh, fundamentally excluded it. That was fortunately not the case in, in the Netherlands. Um, and before the coalition agreement uh, uh, that was released in December um, came about, there were already two years of more growing political interest. And that interest not only had to do with climate, uh, which we uh, already mentioned, but also in our case with the fact that the Groningen field, one of the largest gas fields in Europe, uh, caused earthquakes. And because of that, the Groningen field uh, um, was shut down. Uh, and because of that, we were really in need of a flexible source of energy, a new flexible source of energy for the future. So there was something particular for our country. The second reason is that the Netherlands, as I said, is very densely populated. And people started calculating that uh, three nuclear power plants compared to 3,000 square kilometers of solar panels that you need. So 300 square kilometers, that's an enormous amount of land in my country, uh, uh, maybe a 1 of the of the territory compared to the, the, the space that three nuclear reactors uh, need. So with that in mind, um, the coalition agreement came forward with uh, uh, two proposals. First is to extend the lifetime of the existing nuclear power plant that we have. Uh, and in addition, build two new nuclear power plants. Um, to do that, we started with a market consultation because we wanted to know which market parties are prepared to invest in nuclear power plants. And we also wanted to know what is the public support for these kind of uh, uh, technologies and in which regions we could realize the project best. Well, that market consultation lasted for about half a year. Um, uh, 41 participants were uh, interviewed, including contractors, core technology suppliers, operators, decommissioning specialists, financers, um, 
and in also many of the, the public stakeholders in the regions. And let me share with you some of the key conclusions of that market consultation. I guess many of these elements are, are familiar to you, but it's good to uh, sometimes keep on stressing them before you are starting to build a new power plan. The first uh, reaction that we got from, uh, from the parties uh, involved was uh, a strong emphasis on choosing a proven reactor technology uh, that meets the safety requirements, um, uh, because that also helps uh, in dealing with cost overruns uh, and safety uh, uh, requirements uh, and regulatory environments. So uh, we hear a lot about the small modular reactors. Um, that's, of course, extremely exciting uh, uh, for the future. But now, because we don't have that much experience uh, with nuclear power plants, there was a strong preference for choosing a proven reactor technology. Second, and I think this is also familiar, Mahmoud already alluded to it, is the enormous importance of a stable government and regulatory policy. Um, because these projects last for, for, for 10, 12 years before they are finally built, it's extremely important that even if we have changing government coalitions, the government policy will remain the same. It's of course sometimes difficult to predict in democracies, but this was the key concern for market participants, having a stable government policy, uh, which includes a substantial financing size available for a long time and a capacity to bear substantial risks and lead time risks. That was the second major observation in our market consultation. And the third um, uh, and, and a, a key uh, lesson that we learned was uh, um, that given the uh, enormous risks that are involved, there has to be some government uh, role for commitment uh, in the financing and the insurance uh, of the project. Otherwise, market participants uh, with their challenged balance sheets at the moment uh, said we cannot bear that risk. In the past, we know private parties have borne all the risks for building these nuclear power plants. Uh, the message we got was, no, we need some sort of government protection in there. Otherwise, uh, it's not going to work with our current balance sheets. And finally, of course, public support is essential. Um, we already have one nuclear power plant that is well integrated into the region, that communicates well with the people uh, where uh, the, the power plant is located, and that is absolutely essential. So what will we uh, uh, do now? Um, we will, uh, uh, of course, uh, make a law to extend the lifetime of our existing power plant to uh, the year 2023. Um, we have to, change, uh, have to change the Dutch Nuclear Energy Act uh, uh, for that and to investigate whether this is technically possible. Um, we will also take now the necessary steps for the construction of two nuclear uh, power plants. And for that, we also need to understand what is the exact role of these power plants within our full uh, uh, electricity system. We have a lot of wind at sea. We build 55 gigawatts of wind at sea uh, until the year 2050. What is the role of nuclear in there? Nuclear can be the power source. Uh, uh, that, is, that is flexible, that has power at will. Uh, at the same time, if you have so much cheap wind energy, that says something about the costs at which the nuclear power plant will operate. So it's important to look at the place of the nuclear power plant within the whole energy system of the future to make design principles. Um, so with that, uh, um, happy uh, uh, in the future also to to tell you more about uh, the lessons that we have learned. And finally, uh, um, as we know, uh, construction costs and the budgets are uh, extremely challenging for these projects. Sometimes 60% of a project can be made up by financing costs for the nuclear power plant. Fortunately, interest rates are low, but we don't know how long they will stay low uh, in the current inflationary outlook. So it's important to learn from each other in these workshops how we can reduce overall construction risk, and how we can reduce overall costs. And therefore, um, I'm delighted to participate in this workshop. And I wish you all a very good workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Heydra, for uh, these opening remarks. Also for sharing with us uh, what looks an exciting, exciting 
project and the, the recent policy developments uh, in nuclear uh, in, in Netherlands, and also to highlight this system perspective uh, on the role of nuclear in energy system, which is something also that we are uh, actively exploring in the, in the agency. It's important to learn from other experiences. And that's the thing that we are really going to do in the first session. And also thank you for your time because right now there are very, these are very busy times in, in the ministry. So thank you also for your time. Uh, so now I propose to move to the first two sessions of, of this workshop. Um, today we will be covering uh, we will explore a uh, recent construction with aiming at, as Michel Heydra said, to share recent experiences, to learn from other projects. And also we will focus on a specific techniques, construction and manufacturing techniques that are already being used or could be used specifically, let's say in the short term. Uh, so the first session, uh, is called Lessons Learned from the Construction of Past and Recent Large Nuclear Projects, and will be moderated by Mrs. Diane Cameron. Uh, Mrs. Cameron is head of the Nuclear Technology Development and Economics Division at the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency. In her role at the NEA, uh, she leads uh, nuclear energy policy development among NEA member countries by advancing evidence-based authoritative assessments and analysis in the areas of nuclear economics, financing, cost reduction, as well as, as, well, as well as nuclear technology innovation and field cycle. From 2014 to 2021, Diane was director of the Nuclear Energy Division with the government of Canada, where she headed up the division responsible for leading and coordinating Canadian public policy on nuclear energy and serve as the chair of the Canada's Small Modular Reactors Roadmap and Associated Action Plan. Uh, so please, Diane, go ahead. Thank you, Antonio. And hello to everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, kicking off the first session of this important workshop. Uh, this first session on lessons learned from construction of past and recent large nuclear projects. And um, we have a terrific lineup of panelists for this discussion. Um, but before we uh, get started with the discussion, I'll just take a moment to, to share a few reflections on the importance, the strategic importance of this topic at this time. Director General Magwood already emphasized for us, uh, you know, the, the, the strategic context of the climate change crisis and the imperative to decarbonize uh, energy systems around the world. Um, we layer on top of that now uh, the importance of ensuring that as we decarbonize, we are rolling out uh, safe and secure energy systems um, and that we have an eye on security of fuel supply chains and security of, uh, of energy supply. Nuclear has to play a vital role in uh, these pathways to safe and secure net zero futures. Um, all credible pathways show us that nuclear must uh, must expand significantly, doubling if not tripling or more by mid-century. And so there are a number, number of important enabling conditions, conditions necessary for success, for the success of nuclear to play that role. And one of those critical enabling conditions is around cost reductions. Um, large nuclear projects in Western OECD countries have experienced time and cost overruns in recent years. Uh, this is always present in the discussion uh, about uh, new nuclear uh, projects. Um, and this experience, we have to understand these experiences of cost overruns and time overruns within uh, a context. The, these projects have come after a long hiatus from nuclear new build projects. And we can learn and we must consider other examples um, about large nuclear reactors that are being built in other regions of the world in a more predictable manner um, where other regions of the world and other project proponents have adopted a programmatic um, approach to sustain industrial capabilities. Uh, we believe, therefore, that costs that have been seen in recent Western OECD examples reflect not only the cost of the project or the cost of the reactor, if you will, but also the costs 
embedded in rebuilding industrial capabilities that have uh, been allowed to atrophy, as well as the costs of relearning. Uh, valuable learnings from the field, uh, field of civil uh, nuclear works, modularization of large reactors, advanced manufacturing, as well as management of large complex infrastructure projects. In other words, these experiences are building capabilities, building capacities, ramping up supply chains, and creating a basis of knowledge that represent collectively an opportunity. So instead of looking at these projects as uh, proof of something that is unachievable. Instead, we should look at them as investments that create a platform for future success. And those lessons learned from, from these experiences can inform the optimization of designs with a view to constructability and project management. So we've all heard the phrases safety by design and security by design. In a sense, what we want to start a conversation about now is constructability by design. Um, and with a view to reducing costs and reducing construction risks for the much needed build out of new nuclear power uh, around the world, including in Western OECD countries. So without any further delay, I'd like to now introduce our uh, distinguished panelists. I'll start by introducing Mr. Chang, who is Vice President of the New Nuclear Business Department at KHNP. Between 2012 and 2015, he acted as the company representative at KHNP's Washington DC office, managing the APR 1400 design certification project by liaising with the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He also expanded KHNP's relationship with utilities, vendors, and organizations in the US. He started his career as a nuclear operator at Hanul NPP Nuclear Power Plant, and he has also occupied several technical and commercial positions in the Kido Korean Peninsula Energy Development Organization Nuclear Power Project. Mr. Chang, uh, welcome, and the floor is yours for your presentation, please. Thank you, Diane. Uh... So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Harry Cheng and I'm leading the European Business Development at KHMP, Korea Hydro and Nuclear Power. I'm very honored to have the chance to give a presentation here today. The title of my presentation is Lessons Learned from KHMP's Nuclear New Build Project. Next slide, please. So the objective of this session is to explore how to reduce or mitigate construction risks and costs. In this aspect, I will briefly introduce KHMP and its experience in nuclear new build projects, then talk about lessons learned from new build projects in relation to safety, quality versus cost and schedule. And finally, project management and advanced technologies. Next slide, please. Next one, please. So KHMP is the third largest nuclear power owner and operator in terms of installed capacity. Uh, it is a state-owned company and the largest electricity generator in Korea, producing around 30% of domestic electricity demand. Uh, KHMP has constructed 34 units of nuclear power plants so far, among which 25 are in operation and seven are under construction. Its total assets reached 54 billion US dollars as of 2020 with 12,000 employees. Next slide, please. The Korean nuclear industry has established a very unique business structure over the past 50 years called Team Korea or Team KHMP. KHMP is the only owner and operator of nuclear power plants in Korea, also acting as the ultimate project manager and EPC contractor for new build projects. Under KHMP's leadership, there are engineering companies, equipment suppliers, nuclear fuel suppliers, maintenance service providers, construction companies, and so on. So we have constructed dozens of nuclear power plants together in Korea and abroad. Uh, for project development in the global nuclear market, the structure of Team Korea is not tied to stock ownerships or legal commitment. Instead, each member is accustomed to this business structure and considers it best to suit for the successful impl implementation of the projects, as has been verified from over 50 years of experience. Even though there are many success factors for nuclear power construction, I believe this proven and experienced teamwork, along with mutual trust and understanding, 
and clear roles and responsibilities are the keys to success. Next slide, please. Since 1971, KHMP has been ceaselessly constructing and operating nuclear power plants. Currently, we have five nuclear sites in Korea with 24 units in operation. Next slide, please. Here you can see photos of the nuclear power plants in Korea. Uh, it is worthy to note that we have constructed 10 units of the OPR 1000, uh, minimizing risks and improving economic efficiency through repetitive construction of the same type of reactor. Next slide, please. We are now constructing four units in Korea, which are Shin Hanul 1 and 2 and Shin Kori 5 and 6. They are APR 1400 reactors, which are the generation three plus type. Next slide, please. The photos here are the Baraka U U nuclear power plants in the United Arab Emirates. These are all APR 1400 reactors. The construction of unit one was completed in May, 2018 and entered into commercial operation in April, 2021. Unit two has been connected to the grid and construction of unit three has been completed. This is a turnkey project and the reference plant is Shinkori unit three. Uh, in total, 10 units of the APR 1400 have been constructed or are being constructed in Korea and in the United Arab Emirates. Next slide, please. The APR 1400 design was certified by the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission in August 2019, and its European design was also certified by the European Utility Organization in November 2017. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, when we talk about nuclear power plant construction, safety and economics are usually seen as inversely proportional because additional costs are required when we pursue additional safety measures. However, by investing in safety and quality, we can actually avoid cost overrun and schedule delays. If there is a severe safety accident or a quality issue during the project, the project owner assesses the incident and suspends the entire project depending on the severity. I will introduce some examples of new technologies that KHMP actually adopted in its construction projects to ensure safety and quality. So the first is the intelligent CCTV operating system. This system detects four specific motions of break-ins, work, uh, workers falling, SOS signals, smokes and flames. Uh, it sends off warning lights and sounds as it monitors the safety gears of workers. The system allows accident prevention and precautionary measures by responding quickly to emergencies. Next slide, please. Next is the smart lifting work monitoring system. We installed the sensors on 14 cranes at the Shinkori 5 and 6 construction site to monitor lifting works in real time. Now in the monitoring room, you can check the operation time of the equipment and lifting work history. Next slide, please. Now the system monitors if there is any overloading, unauthorized work, excessive wind speed, and so on. It automatically sends a message to supervisors and workers to, pre to prevent uh, possible accidents. Next slide, please. Next is the proximity alert system. To avoid collision between heavy load vehicles and flag manual workers, we installed 36 detectors on stackers or excavators. When a worker tagged with a detection device gets closer to the vehicle, an alarm and vibration alert goes off to warn the driver and workers to prevent, to prevent collisions. Next slide, please. Now here are some technologies that enhance the quality of our nuclear new build projects. First is the workers tool management system, which was adapted to prevent careless mistakes during critical construction works, such as loose tools in the RCP motor or steam generator. A clean work area is prepared in a welding place for the reactor coolant system, the construction area for the main control room, and the assembly area for the turbine generator. At the kiosk, workers register tools with a barcode which confirms their return after work, 
preventing quality issues caused by missing hand tools. This system can be adapted in all the operating plants as well. Next slide, please. The second technology is the void detection system. Air gaps in concrete walls of the containment building can be created when pouring the concrete. We use a thermal imaging camera to, to, to measure the heat and predict the void in advance. If there is significant difference in temperature in a specific area before and after pouring the concrete, we can predict that there is a void and take additional measure to fill the air gap. Next slide, please. Uh, before that, I will summarize the second part. So all of these technologies to improve safety and quality lead to the mitigation and minimization of construction risk, securing on time within budget project implementation. Now I will talk about project management and KHMP's advanced technologies. Next slide, please. When we say project management, we talk about the cost, schedule, quality, resources, work scope, and so on. Here, I will focus on how we manage these efficiently, especially with the assistance of some technological devices. The examples are mostly related to information technologies because these enable us to integrate knowledge, skills, tools and techniques of various project management areas into one single system. Next slide, please. KHMPS nuclear power plant construction management system consists of three main systems. The ERP system, INPCMS, or Integrated Nuclear Power Plant Construction Management System, and other web-based systems. The INPCMS plays a critical role in a construction period, while the ERP and web-based systems play supportive roles. The ERP performs cost, document, material, and quality management, and is connected to the INPCMS. The INPCMS consists of 12 modules, such as schedule management, construction information, and design change. There are also three web systems, the NPP nuclear power plant construction information system shows the status of all ongoing projects. The construction knowledge management system complies all incoming, outgoing, and internal documents according to the project. You can easily find information on similar cases of previous units or any data in need. The engineering information management system is a system where design change requests from operation and construction are stored and reviewed to be reflected on the future units. Next slide, please. The INPCMS was first developed in 1993 and has been upgraded and improved uh, throughout, throughout the uh, multiple construction projects. Its prototype had only a few modules like scheduling and later in 2003, expanded to cover every part of construction. Uh, in 2010, a web-based program was introduced for better usability and functionality. The IMPCMS now puts together all the programs and servers that are divided into each project, letting users find information on different projects in the same platform. The program keeps evolving as we continue the construction projects. We can receive all information related to construction and manage works through this system. Next slide, please. Here is the scheme for the uh, schedule management in the INPCMS system. Uh, but for the sake of time, I will skip the detailed explanation. Can we move to the next slide? The next three technologies contribute to efficient project management. The first is main equipment installation simulation. The simulation program was developed using installation manuals of eight main equipment, including the reactor, steam generator, reactor coolant pump, and so on. So with this technology, even new employees with limited work experience can improve workability and prevent accidents. Next slide, please. Next is the advanced 3D model. The existing 3D model only allowed workers to check for overlaps in equipment, 
pipes and structures. We added data equal to 100,000 tags of instruments and conduits and collected digital assets by linking the design, procurement, and construction information of equipment. This data sums up to about 740,000 tags. Along with detecting the overlaps, we can find the interference, interference area of instruments and other, other complicated installations and improve construction and minimize reworks. Next slide, please. The last technology is the 4D construction system. We created a 4D simulation by connecting, connecting the 3D model of a cyber plant to each activity in the construction schedule. This, sim this simulates the status of the work according to the schedule. You can review past activities, find the interferences in design and construction, and check whether the construction process is appropriate or is or not. Next slide, please. So let me briefly conclude my presentation. Uh, let's move to the last slide. So as demonstrated, there are many examples from our experience, which show that safety and quality improvement in nuclear power construction projects are helpful in keeping the project on time and within budget by, you know, by avoiding industrial safety accidents or unnecessary reworks or repairs. And efficient project management can be achieved through advanced technologies. IT systems, for example, KHNPs, INP, CMS, have been developed, upgraded, and improved over the past decades to mitigate or reduce construction risks. And lastly, as I spoke earlier in my presentation about Team Korea uh, led by KHMP, continuous, construct, continuous uh, and abundant construction experience and a solid project management team with mutual trust are essential for the success of the new nuclear new build project. And strong leadership, project management skills, and ultimate accountability by the project owner or a single EPC contractor is required to ensure a successful outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chang. That was uh, very interesting, uh, very informative, and, and very impressive. Um, before I invite our second uh, panelist to present, maybe I'll follow up with, uh, with one question now, and then we can continue the discussion in the, uh, after the other two presentations. Um, my initial question for you um, goes to, um, you've shown us uh, quite a few very interesting innovations and really, um, our discussion here is about um, advanced construction and manufacturing, but the innovations you've shown us, they all have a very significant digital component to them. Like I, we saw a lot of digital uh, uh, innovation and information in systems innovations in what you've shown us from the use of CCTV, smart lifting, proximity alerts, uh, tool management system, void detection system, um, even your 4D um, uh, construction simulation, they, these are all the integration of digital technologies into construction projects. How, to, to, do you have any basis for, um, for estimating how, how much of your success can you attribute to these digital innovations? How much of the savings in cost and time um, what is your basis for attributing success to these innovations compared to other aspects, maybe a work culture or project management or other, um, other factors on the construction site? Um, and because I guess I'm, I'm imagining that some projects that run over cost and over budget also have uh, uh, the intention to use these digital innovations but may not have the same success. And so from your experience across multiple projects in multiple regions of the world, um, I, can you comment on, is it really just about this digital innovation or, or is there more to the question? So uh, I would say digital solution is very important, especially in this uh, you know, very fast changing world uh, in terms of technology. So. Uh, the digital solutions I introduced uh, were actually adopted in KHMP's construction projects, and it was very helpful. It, it has been very helpful. So 
For example, if we can uh, avoid a fatal or ca casualty by adopting the proximity uh, alert system, that that is cost that that's priceless. So it is very important to adapt uh, as many uh, digital solutions as possible to make the project uh, on time and within budget. But on top of that, uh, as you mentioned, uh, for example, work culture and project management and things like that, I think those things are equally important or, some, uh, or uh, even more important in terms of the success in, in terms of the success of the project. So uh, personally, I think project management is uh, more important than adapting uh digital digital solutions or digital transformation things because uh we can easily adapt digital solutions uh but we cannot uh make our team successful uh in a very short time uh, without uh without mutual trust or understanding Thank you so much for those comments. I look forward to exploring that theme uh, more when we, after the next two presentations, when we have a, a good discussion with all three panelists. Uh, so now I'd like to turn to uh, introduce Didier Noel. Uh, Mr. Noel is Methods Temporary Works Lead at Bylor Joint Venture for the EPR Hinkley Point C project in Somerset, UK. He has over 20 years of experience in technical design management. Uh, Mr. Noel has been responsible for the construction methodology of large civil works projects in which the development uh, in which he developed the ability to overcome complex construction problems with effective solutions. This includes nuclear power plants, bridges and harbor projects in both France and abroad. Uh, Didier, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Diana. Good day, all. Uh, I, uh, so uh, I am starting uh, my presentation with uh, this beautiful picture of uh, Flamanville uh, EPR3, uh, EPR2, uh, Flamanville 3 uh, liner dome erection. So um, uh, WICTP uh, uh, was uh, deeply involved in nuclear civil project during uh, the 80 and 90 with uh, mainly the construction of uh, several NP NPP uh, including uh, Flamanville uh, 1 and 2. In 2005, uh, BookTP uh, start again the post Chernobyl construction of NPP in Western Europe uh, with uh, all Kyoto EPR project in Finland. Uh, BookTP is not an EPC contractor uh, and uh, as uh, the company of my uh, today uh, colleague, uh, BrickTP is not a process architect, uh, not a designer. BrickTP is a main civil work uh, contractor with a, a variable scope from one project to another, uh, according, uh, according the, the client. Uh, so, uh, so EDF, ED, EDF uh, is uh, the, Fren the French uh, electrician or uh, a subsidiary of EDF, uh, so uh, Areva for OL3, NMB for HPC, uh, is uh, the client uh, and the architect and the designer of the EPR built by uh, uh, BWICTP. Nevertheless, uh, BWICTP intervenes uh, very early in the design process uh, to help EDF uh, provide the most buildable design. On OL3, uh, BWICTP got a pure civil work scope with the concrete structure of the nuclear cross and nuclear auxiliary and uh, radioactive waste uh, building. On, uh, on FA3, Flamanville, the scope was even wider. It includes the civil work of all the building, all the structure, but also the liner containment and the liner pool. On HPC, uh, it, um, it is uh, against a wider scope. In addition to the civil work and the liner, by law, uh, the GZ between BWICTP and Lengorork 
manage also the secondary steel work, the coating, the door, and uh, uh, other finishes. Brick TP uh, know very well the specificity of the nuclear project and the impact of the, uh, of the nuclear safety, the necessary surveillance linked to this uh, nuclear safety, the risk on the schedule due to this uh, nuclear safety. Considering this uh, schedule risk due to the safety nuclear impact, modularization is uh, very well adapted to nuclear project to remove as much as possible the schedule risk from the project critical path. So, uh, so the base gain, uh, so uh, the knowledge of feedback gain on OL3 and FA3 project allow BTP uh, to develop modularization, prefabrication, and precast, considering the base gain by removing from the main critical path area with the more important interface the lifting capacity of the available heavy load crane, and the possibility to design lifting equipment, lifting anchorage. A first example, uh, removing uh, uh, interface from the main critical path can be the large module of the liner containment. Uh, this uh, large module allows to decrease the length of the leak tight uh, welding length on, uh, on the critical path. So you can see uh, here the reaction of the liner ring one uh, on unit uh, two uh, of last year. So you can see it's a 17 meter uh, high uh, liner ring uh, for, the, for the containment. Several uh, type of heavy load crane can be used. Uh, solution of ring crane with the possibility of relocation in the, in the, is the best, uh, especially when there are several units. You are going to see that uh, later on on, uh, on, the, on the plan view, where uh, uh, on HPC we have a three, uh, three ring. So uh, this pilot crane uh, so is uh, the HGC uh, 250. Uh, provided by uh, supply and operated by uh, Sarans. Uh, this heavy load crane allows to lift uh, 1,600 tons uh, at uh, 105 meters, so approximately the center of the reactor. Uh, we can lift also uh, more than 700 tons at 165 meters. Uh, another, another example of, uh, of a modular, modularization is uh, the, 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 line, uh, the liner pool uh, module, uh, which allows to remove uh, easily interfaced area where there is a, a succession of handover between, um, between reinforcement, uh, stainless steel uh, liner work, and concrete work. You can see on this uh, picture the erection of the first uh, liner tank, uh, liner pool uh, module for the, the ALG uh, in, the, in the safeguard building one of uh, Inkley. And here it is uh, the, the cavity reactor module uh, currently uh, ongoing. Uh, the, pre the prefabrication of this module is currently ongoing. In the, in the bunker of, uh, of Inkley, in the pool bunker of Inkley. Um, and finally, a third example of uh, several heavy precast. Uh, for, for this heavy precast, the, the following point shall be stu studied. So uh, the, the stitching of the precast uh, shall be doable. Uh, it's not easy, always easy to, to find an element uh, to precast uh, that we were able after to reconnect to the, to the other part of the structure, uh, especially with uh, the rebar requirement, uh, the, the rebar detailing, uh, reinforcement detailing requirement that we have in nuclear project. Um, the gain on uh, interface, uh, interface risk again, 
Euh, Pre-cash shall, shall include a special embedded part, uh, uh, sump, uh, pipe. Uh, so, for instance, uh, this lab on HR, uh, uh, South Precast Lab, include a lot of uh, sump, uh, uh, Precast, uh, RP pipe. Uh, so, it's, uh, it's very good to, to remove these interfaces uh, from, the, from the building construction. Same thing for the, the radial wall. So we have also to, to, to study the gain on the critical path versus the weather risk to get the lifting window with the heavy load crane. We cannot use uh, the, 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 we have a wind limit uh, for, to you, for using the heavy load crane. So we, we have to be careful to not uh, put too many lifts on the, on the heavy load crane because after it's no more again for the project, but, but it becomes a, a risk on the schedule. So uh, you can see that uh, for the two units of HPC, we develop uh, more than 500 prefabricated elements, uh, which requires uh, the, an heavy lift. And uh, in addition, with 100 uh, lift that uh, the heavy load crane have to do already for the process equipment, like uh, the polar crane, uh, uh, several tank, uh, uh, main control room, and, uh, and other. So, um, as uh, already uh, explained my, by my previous colleague, uh, the development of the digital digitalization uh, is another uh, is another uh, uh, important point, uh, allowing to mitigate, anticipate uh, the risk of delay due to the nuclear safety and especially uh, BIM, full 3D modeling, uh, including rebar. You can see here um, the digital continuity uh, between uh, process architect, uh, designer, and uh, civil war contractor for the reinforcement. So uh, 3D model uh, uh, here is provided by the, by the process architect. Uh, the civil war contractor uh, built the core split and uh, provide uh, the rebar detailing uh, requirement. And after the designer can can make uh, uh, can use this model to start to build the rebar uh, uh, rebar modeling. After it's possible to to do the rebar declashing with uh, with this model. And then, after this model is used by uh, by the civil war contractor to uh, uh, to manage uh, all the, the the construction of the of the rebar cages and uh, and the prefabrication and uh, all the all the method uh, temporary work to erect the the, the rebar. So. Nevertheless, uh, drawing less and paperless uh, shall remain a simplification uh, for staff and labor and not uh, a complexification, considering this process are easiest to manage due to the, to the digitalization. Additional points. Uh, uh, for the success, uh, additional point necessary for the success of uh, a nuclear power plant. So the site uh, shall be very large with enough area around the building. So in clay is a very good example. So here you have a uh, visible um, plan view uh, of, uh, of in clay. Uh, Incle is a very uh, well uh, equip, equip uh, uh, site uh, with uh, three um, three office clock room canteen east uh, uh, west east and, uh, and uh, north uh, here. You can see that uh, we have uh, you can see the, the three ring for the heavy load train that I uh, that I uh, explained previously. So uh, the, the central ring uh, is uh, the main ring for the unit one. The west ring is the main ring for unit two. 
and uh, and uh, we have also an East ring allowing to build uh, uh, to lift uh, other other building. Uh, you can see that on, on the south of this uh, heavy load crane uh, rail, we have uh, area allowing to install uh, the heavy prefabrication, heavy modularization. So you can see uh, two uh, bunkers for the prefabrication uh, of the liner uh, containment uh, module. You can see uh, here uh, two, two bunkers. Uh, bunker east and bunker west for the prefabrication of the pool module. You can see also uh, that, uh, that there are a lot of area. Uh, so here it's possible to install uh, uh, very well organized uh, uh, area for the prefabrication of the rubber cages and uh, another area here for the formwork. And you can see here the, the, the four units uh, for the, of batching plant. So this site is very well organized with uh, uh, the bus. You can see here the bus station to uh, allowing uh, to, to the people to, to arrive on site. And after, there is an internal bus services for all the sites. So it's, uh, for me, it plays a very, very good example of a, a, a good site well prepared. By, by the oh, sorry, by, uh, by the client. Uh, in Flamanville, the site uh, was uh, was not uh, <laughs> it was a bad example due to the small distance between the building and the cliff on the on the on the east side, and uh, and the, the previous unit on the south side here. And the, and the national grid uh, connection on the north side. So you can see that the room for the installation around the building is uh, very, uh, very tricky. And so uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a very difficult to, to install uh, an heavy load crane uh, for a long uh, duration, long time duration. And so it is not possible to, to develop uh, heavy prefabrication. Uh, moreover, the, the confined uh, space requires additional work to prevent the fall. For instance, here you can see it was necessary to build a, a tower around the, the, the crane uh, mast uh, to prevent a, a fall of the crane on the previous unit. So it's, it's definitely not a, a good example uh, for, uh, for the area uh, that uh, are necessary to build uh, such a structure. So, in another hand, uh, access to uh, Flamanville uh, is very good, in fact. Uh, the, the road uh, and uh, good, uh, so we can have a very good access through the road. Uh, it's a very large road uh, to, uh, allowing to, to access to Flamanville. And, uh, and also uh, through the sea with uh, the Dialet uh, Arbour. Uh, Dialet Arbour is very close from the, from the, the plant, in fact. Uh, moreover, delivery uh, were easy and the park and, and, and ride were very close, less than two, uh, two kilometers and 10 minutes of transport from, from the site allowing a reduced transport duration for the labor and the staff. Uh, on Inclay project, the, the, the site uh, is, is more, uh, more difficult for the access due to the, the bottleneck of, uh, of Bridgewater. You can see that all the traffic have to pass through Bridgewater to, to arrive to Inclay. And so uh, it's necessary to the, the NNB, the client, develop uh, uh, two, uh, two park and ride, junction, junction 23, junction 24. But, uh, uh, but the distance between this park and ride to the nuclear power plant uh, is uh, 20 kilometers long. And so it's approximately uh, 30, 40 minutes of, bu of buses 
uh, to go from this junction to the nuclear power plant, so uh, to the site. So it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult. Moreover, uh, for the, there is a, a GT for the, the delivery of aggrega and small uh, equipment uh, uh, through the sea. But uh, the, the larger and heavier equipment have to be delivered through Combich Wharf. And Combich Wharf um, is, um, has a lot of uh, tidal constraint. So it's, uh, it's difficult also to use Combich Wharf. So, it's, uh, uh, so finally, uh, the, the, uh, the external arrangement of, uh, of Inclay is. is uh, Worse than uh, than uh, Flamanville. Uh, so now I want to speak about uh, the resources uh, uh, because uh, I did not put uh, this point first, but uh, it is obviously the main the main one. Uh, mobilization of uh, the necessary resources. Uh, the necessary competence, uh, great, uh, skill, knowledge, ability, training, experience, uh, is very important. For, uh, uh, for the civil work of two EPR, we have to consider approximately uh, 4,000 uh, uh, labor and uh, 1,200 staff. So uh, the area uh, need to be very attractive to, to mobilize this, uh, this, this people. Mobilization of uh, spe specialized uh, company like a stainless steel liner also, it's a very important point in resources. Uh, the discontinuity of uh, the nuclear power plant new build program in Western country is not a good point to ensure uh, a continuous workload of uh, this uh, specialized company. So um, it's, uh, it's always uh, difficult uh, uh, because uh, we, we, at the end of Flamorid, we got uh, uh, a company uh, specialized for the stainless steel liner, but uh, the, the time between uh, Flamorville and, uh, and Inclay was too long and, uh, and this, this company uh, uh, lost, lost their, uh, their, their, their resources. Um, so uh, we have to prevent also a huge turnover for this long project, uh, very often more than 10 years, uh, as explained later, and, uh, and uh, from start to design, uh, from start of design to uh, COD. Uh, and for such project, uh, people are efficient if they remain more than three years. Uh, uh, less than three years, uh, the time to, to, to learn what, uh, what uh, are uh, uh, nuclear safety, uh, what are the specificity of the nuclear project, uh, uh, you cannot be efficient. So training of the future worker staff also uh, shall be anticipated with the support of the Department of, of Education. It's something that uh, that we did uh, very well in, in Flamanville to, to develop, uh, uh, to, develop uh, the, the, to train the, the resources. So uh, after, um, I want also to, to list here uh, uh, some difficulty, the, the, the difficulty that we have uh, in, the, in the management of uh, of the nuclear power plant. Uh, um, it is all the, the 4D interfaces uh, uh, that we have. Uh, and, and, and this 4D interfaces have to be uh, uh, very well anticipated uh, by letting more float uh, and or more distance between uh, stakeholders. So uh, as an example, uh, 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 equip equipment input uh, for uh, the uh, the the load the load of the equipment uh, uh, the bearing load of equipment uh, uh, arrive always very late uh, uh, and so the designer is not able to 
to, to do the design of the building because he, he, he don't, he, 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 they didn't have the, the, the proper uh, load. So it is uh, one, uh, one problem that uh, after give delay on the design. So here it's a, uh, it's a, it's a problem. And, and, the, and generally the equipment uh, load is late because the procurement is late. So it's a, it's a, it's an interface uh, that, uh, that have to be anticipated and, uh, and uh, as I told you, uh, we have to put float between, uh, between this task. Uh, so after, when the design is late, uh, the, the design, uh, uh, the work become late because the design, uh, uh, we, we cannot anticipate uh, the work uh, enough in advance. Uh, another uh, interface is between earth work and civil work. So the, the area are never handed over to the civil work at the good time uh, because uh, the civil work, the earth work sequence is, uh, is always uh, very difficult to manage and, uh, and it's very difficult to, to hand over a, a small area uh, uh, on, a, on a large plant uh, without impacting the, the productivity of, of the earth work. So it's, uh, it's something that has to be uh, very well anticipated and, uh, and uh, where we have to put float. And the uh, same thing between en enabling work and civil work. And after, but there are all the interference uh, when uh, we build the building. Uh, so uh, um, uh, we have to avoid uh, over edit work uh, between, bu between uh, several buildings uh, built at different uh, uh, speed. So it's, uh, it's uh, always a problem. And so after, it's uh, for the finishes, uh, interface between finishes and, uh, and MEH. So, uh, and uh, last, last point, um, uh, because uh, it's uh, something that, uh, that we have to take into account currently due to the fact that we want to, to export uh, our, our project. And, uh, so the, a, a design is never transposable from a country to another. It is always more or less uh, impacted by the cultural differences, the local nuclear uh, specification, the local civil war general specification, and the local human resources. So uh, we will see uh, the, this impact when we uh, we will see this difference between Flamanville and HPC, for instance, or between uh, Old Kiloto and, uh, and Flamanville. So, um, so we, we, we have to take that always into account. Uh, it's not possible to have a catalog uh, of a project and to, to be sure that it will be transposable uh, easily uh, to another country. That's all for me. I uh, don't know if I am in time. Uh, Jan. Thank you. I was just looking for my, uh, my the unmute button. Thank you uh, very much, Didier, for, for that interesting uh, presentation. I, I especially appreciate um, the emphasis and the focus that you brought on the physicality of the project, um, the, the physicality of the site, um, considerations of, of, of physical space and layout and uh, interactions with the neighboring uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, I have um, maybe, I mean, I have a number of questions. I, most of them I'll save for the, for the discussion portion, but I'll, I'll follow with one question right now. Um, do you have a sense of, um, we saw a lot of mo physical modules in the, the, the photos that you showed us. Um, you know, prefabricated or precast uh, modules that were then lifted with special crane equipment to site and then connected with, at, at their points of interface. When do you have a philosophy or or a, or or thoughts on when is it better to stick build uh, versus when is it better to modularize uh, your your uh, your project and how do you decide? what should be stick built and which aspects of the project should be modularized? I, yeah, it is what I tried to explain during my presentation. Uh, in fact, we, uh, we consider that it's, uh, it's good to, to modularize uh, when we remove uh, uh, 
a lot of interfaces from the, the site. Huh? Um, because each time that we have interfaces, uh, we, we need to mobilize, demobilize, uh, remobilize uh, uh, people, and, uh, and uh, we lose a lot of time. So um, it's, uh, it's very important uh, to remove this activity from the site and to put this activity in a dedicated area. Uh, so it's, it's uh, the, the first point. The second point, it's about uh, the, the, the type of activity uh, for, for the pool. Uh, all, all activity uh, which require welding is very interesting to remove this activity because welding needs to be uh, uh, protected. Uh, uh, we need to, to have a weather shelter uh, uh, protection to, to have a, a, a good quality for the welding. So, uh, so it's another uh, good reason to, to remove this, uh, this activity from the site and to, and to put this activity in a dedicated uh, bunker uh, uh, area to, modula, to, to modularize uh, that. To what extent, I know I, I said I would ask only one question, but I have, I have another follow-up question, which is to what, to what extent do your decisions around uh, how to optimize your modules depend on the physicality of your site? Um, so are there, and, and the follow-on question to that then is, can you then standardize across multiple geographically different sites with different climates and different access to ports? Would you draw your module distinctions and interfaces in the same place? But, uh, yes, uh, it, is, uh, it is one of our problems, uh, <laughs> indeed, yes, because uh, uh, when, when we have not enough room uh, be around the building, it's not possible to install uh, the, the modularization uh, bunker, prefabrication bunker under the Villot crane. And so uh, when it's necessary to, to, trans to, to, to transport, to transfer uh, a large element uh, uh, from a prefabrication area uh, far away from the, the, the main Villot crane, it becomes uh, very complicated and, uh, and maybe time consuming uh, for, the, for the project. So it's, um, it's, it's definitely better to, to, uh, to have a site with enough room under the, the heavy load crane to be able to prefabricate directly under the heavy load crane. Thank you very much, Didier. Uh, with that, I'd like to now turn to our third uh, distinguished panelist. Uh, Mr. Greg Barnett. Uh, Mr. Barnett is Oversight Manager at Georgia Power Company. He has over 20 years of industrial experience and thousands of projects on the books. With experience in procurement, construction, and startup on the Vogel nuclear power plant expansion, um, Mr. Barnett has led teams solving challenges in all areas of the project. And uh, in his bio, he tells us his proudest moments at Vogel include placing the top module on the shield buildings of Vogel units three and four, as well as achieving hot functional testing on unit three. Uh, Greg, the floor is yours. So good afternoon, good morning. Thank you to the NEA team. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the participants today for your time. I know your time is very valuable and I'd like to leave you with a few things from the uh, project here in North America. I'm in the state of Georgia, a uh, couple hours east of Atlanta, the uh, state's capital, just south of Augusta, Georgia, probably most known across the world for the uh, Masters Tournament, which is coming up here. It's a golf tournament, a small golf tournament coming up here in two or three weeks. Uh, it'll have a lot, of, um, a lot of recognition with most people here probably. So. Uh, that's our geographic location. A little bit about Southern Company. Um, we have 9 million customers. That is, um, that's with our businesses in the electric space, natural gas distribution, uh, wholesale energy. <clears throat> the uh, three, we're, we're in three states here in, uh, in the United States with our electric utility, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. We're in four states with natural gas distribution. And uh, we also, again, provide wholesale energy, dis uh, distributed energy solutions, fiber optics, and wireless communications across all 50 states, or uh, the mainland, 48 states um, uh, here, here in the US. So that's a little bit about Sutter Company. Um, 
in Georgia, I work for Georgia Power currently and, uh, and also serve our Southern Nuclear uh, Services business. Uh, I'm at the Plant Vogel facility on the Plant Vogel expansion. Uh, we have two units here currently in operation. Uh, Vogel 1 and 2, they were built back in the uh, 1980s and 90s. And uh, we're currently building Vogel units three and four with AP1000 technology provided by uh, Westinghouse. And so uh, appreciate the time today. Uh, it, the, uh, the, it, th through the discussion, you know, there's a couple things I'd like for you to take away from this. Uh, one, what's happening at Plant Vogel. And, uh, and two, what are we doing here in modularization space? I'll share a couple of a couple of different points about that. And then, if you're considering, um, like the Netherlands, you're considering building, uh, you're looking for uh, maybe what to do or what not to do in some situations. Uh, we have our uh, Southern Nuclear Services business, and I'll share a slide with you there to kind of show you how we can help owners in project formulation, risk management. Uh, project management and things of that nature. Just share with you some of the things that we've learned over the last decade or so. Um, AP1000 differences uh, compared to our legacy plants that were built uh, in the last century. Just wanted everybody to, to be aware of what's going on here. If you've investigated the AP1000 at all, then you'll know, you, you've probably seen the uh, diagram here to the right. But just in case you haven't, the design, the AP1000, uh, really built in the AP600 footprint or designed in the, in the 600 footprint and built that way. Uh, you can see there to the right, 50% uh, fewer valves, 80% or more less pipe, 85% you know, less cable, 35% fewer safety grade pumps. That was the intention of Westinghouse in, um, in, in laying this design out. Uh, certainly designed with modernization in mind, particularly walls, floors. You've seen some of the uh, similar concepts in previous uh, presentations here. And um, most, most of all the walls and floors intended to be uh, shop built off site and then transported to the site. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the upcoming slides. Um, as far as AP1000 goes, uh, with the reactor coolant pumps, there were some intentional changes made here with a can rotor so that you have no uh, seal water on that pump. Legacy plants, of course, having seal water. Uh, the uh, reactor coolant pumps are attached to the bottom of the steam generators. So that's a, that's a difference in the legacy plants that, uh, that we haven't seen uh, really till now. Uh, VFDs. Uh, we have the variable frequency drives for low speed operations. Uh, that way you're not cycling uh, motors and such as that, uh, high horsepower motors, and, and uh, you're able to get, give better control to the operators. On the reactor vessel instrumentation, all of that is routed through the top of the RV, which is a little different than the way the legacy plants have done that in the past. And this is a fully digital plant with 13,000 alarms. Um, the intent is for the operator to have mouse interface with a computer that then controls the equipment in the field. We do have some select uh, hard switches that are in the panel, just in case the operator is going to have a really bad day. But uh, that's that's AP1000 differences to the legacy plant. That was what drew us to this technology probably the most, and. Um, we were also, of course, interested uh, in what the Chinese were doing with the technology and, uh, and had been very active in that and were able to learn a lot of things, uh, not only in construction and, and fab fabrication, but also with uh, operations. And so from a modularization standpoint, again, I really wanted to leave you with a few things here um, as you're considering your projects or just share with you some of the things that we've learned. And we, um, we delivered our final module in 2019. The picture there to the right, um, we talked a little bit about some of my proudest moments. This picture here is us, uh, is the project Vogel 3 and 4 on Unit 4, placing the CB20 tank, the CB20 being a Westinghouse designator for that module. 
uh, the, of course, the module fabricated off site, and then we assembled it here on site. Uh, one of your questions earlier was, um, can uh, geography or can actual square footage of a site um, impact your assembly and do you have to factor that in? I agree with, uh, with DDA's uh, answer about um, your, your lay down yards and your assembly spots and, and fab spots really need to be close to where you're gonna make your picks. Um, if you don't, in our case, we have what we call a um, heavy lift derrick road it's a six foot concrete road, allows you to get from one fabrication place to your lifting points. And then you can actually set this, in this case, a CB20 into its location. And so, yes, you wanna be very cognizant of the square footage around the unit. You wanna control uh, access to those places, make sure that you have utilities to those fabrication spots. All those things need to be considered when you're, when you're really thinking through uh, the sequencing of your module installation, and then also the locations where they'd be fabricated around the unit. So I thought that was a good question. I just wanted to mention that as we're talking about this picture. Um, but 14, uh, 1,485 modules total for units three and four. Uh, first started delivery in 2011. And again, all, all were manufactured offsite, transported either here by rail or truck. At one time, Vogel had water delivery on the Savannah River. So you could bring it through the city of Savannah and come up the Savannah River off the Atlantic Ocean. We chose only to go with rail deliveries and trucks for the Vogel three and four expansion, even though one and two did use the waterway access. It, the, the cost just really could not be, uh, the Army Corps engineers looked at it. We just could not make the cost justify rail and truck was just gonna be cheaper, so. Thought that would be interesting given the, the previous presentations too. You'd probably want to know that. And then um, we have a modular assembly building. That's the final point there. Um, we, it's, it's very similar to NASA's uh, concepts of vehicular assembly buildings where they would assemble the space shuttle parts or uh, space travel uh, vehicle parts into one actual vehicle and then uh, move that into its launch location. So very similar concept, the, you know, the building's over, a, it's over a, probably four or five stories tall and it has its own crane and it has plenty of uh, uh, floor space for you to be able to work these bigger modules, handle those and then actually move them to a transporter so that you can get it to the unit and get it installed. So the next two slides that I have here really just wanna leave you with uh, some thoughts about the bigger modules that we had to install. Um, really, really speak on this slide about uh, lessons that we learned in uh, uh, managing the offsite shops and how you, you know, how you kind of work through challenges that you have there. And then the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about what we learned about licensing. So <clears throat> on this slide here, CA20 course is the biggest, it's the largest AP1000 component, nearly a thousand tons. You can see it pictured there uh, about to be set into place. 72 total submodules. It houses the spent, uh, spent fuel pool and other rooms in the South Auxiliary Building. So it's the major portion of the South Auxiliary Building uh, was actually built offsite, then assembled and set into place. So just, you know, let me just make sure everybody's soaking that in. We, we put this building together, we, we fabricated offsite, we put it together in the modular assembly building, and then we transport it and set it into place. Um, that's, that point really goes back to your question about stick building and modularization. When you think about putting an actual building together for a nuclear plant, um, in, you know, when it's set in place, we would do some then stick concepts inside those rooms. You have some, you know, you have some, um, whether it's skid, mechanical skids or structural skids, or whether you've got room completion for Durawall and utilities and things like that, you would have some uh, actual stick construction. But in this case, we again put the whole building together. You know, it's just a key takeaway here that, that, uh, 
that's that's pretty new and and something again i'm really proud of we started this fabrication in lake charles and i'll get into the key lessons here a little bit so <clears throat> we started this fabrication uh, in lake charles louisiana louisiana of course being a major oil and gas hub for north america and for the united states the shop that we started in uh, was 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 a new facility and uh, the the craft that we brought in and a lot of the management that we had there of course at the time this was a, a Westinghouse uh, subcontractor and <clears throat> as we started up with the ONG uh, mentality we quickly learned that nuclear safety culture was something that we would have to uh, enforce and then reinforce time and again uh, particularly around uh, how you manage documentation and how you manage d uh, discrepancies and deficiencies in the production process. Uh, because of that, uh, we, we, we learned a, a number of different things. So in bullet points, uh, what is that, two, three, four, and five under key lessons learned, uh, we, ended up, um, we ended up putting into place a fabricator design finalization team. Um, and what that really means is, in other words, we took engineers from Westinghouse and embedded them into the, um, into the shop. And their main purpose there was to turn around any questions that the craft people may have in trying to do assemblies and make repairs and things like that. Um, we, we learned that it cost a lot and we lost a lot of time in turning around engineering solutions. And so by embedding the Westinghouse engineers, we were able to get, uh, we were able to decrease the turnaround time significantly. Um, another thing that we learned was it's important to have a, a process to dispute cost. Um, as the design challenges stacked up and our engineers really tried to catch the backlog up on problems and deficiency resolution. Of course, the, the bills were coming in for, for Westinghouse and you quickly get into this thing where you have the engineer in dispute with the sub and bills aren't necessarily being paid. And so work starts to slow down and where your cost dispute resolution team comes in is they're able to uh, mitigate that, mediate that and keep the work flowing and in, in lots of cases really just catch the backlog up and uh, and keep people on equal footing um, and i and i'd be prepared to do that immediately out of the gate with any any engineer and sub relationship or owner to sub relationship uh, it'll be really helpful another contingency plan is uh is having multiple experienced module suppliers lined up just in case you get into a situation like we did where Lake Charles was not able to, they were able to get started on a lot of the modules. They really struggled with the safety culture and also with processing uh, changes in the design. When we had that problem, we ended up uh, leaning heavily on Oregon Ironworks and IHI to um, de-scope de from Lake Charles, to pick up the scope that we had and uh, utilize their existing safety culture to, uh, to rectify a lot of the problems that we had and also to help us catch up on the uh, schedule delays that we were having. So uh, the final point there, smallest work packages or smallest possible work packages. You know, whether you're doing uh, fabrication in the shops or you're actually on the site, my, uh, my lesson here and, and what I would offer is work to the smallest possible packages that you can. Don't make the packages uh, large and uh, filled with documents that are not necessary. What you'll find is, is a craftsperson is, is looking for direction on how to use their tools. You're gonna measure them on tool time anyway. And so give them the directions that they need um, uh, give them the work steps, uh, ensure that the inspection uh, whole points are very clear, and don't make it a challenge for a craftsperson to really try to work through what you're asking them to do. Uh, the more they have to do that, the less time they're going to spend on their wrenches, on their tools, 
and your KPI will not be uh, will not be what you'd like for it to be there. So, uh, next slide, please. And this next in this next slide again, I want to share with you a little bit about licensing departures. Some of the things that we learned here on our CAO3 structural module, which is pictured there on the right hand side. The CAO3 module is our in containment refueling water storage tank, 237 tons. Uh, it was fabricated also uh, at Lake Charles and uh, 17 submodules total. So, <clears throat> with the lessons that we learned here in the 90s, when we in the 1900s, when the US was building the legacy plants, we used what we call the Part 50 licensing process through the Nuclear. Uh, regulatory Commission, the NRC. And uh, this go around, we're using a Part 52 process, which is a little bit different in that we're, uh, we picked up the construction and, and operating license combined uh, early in the project, back in the 2011 and 12 uh, timeframe, after we got our early site permit in 2009 or 10. So in this Part 52, um, we, we already have our col colo, what we call it. And uh, one, one thing that we found is in the part 52 process, we utilize the licensing amendment request process much more than we did in the part 50 process. Um, we uh, went with the part 52 because we felt like it would standardize our licensing departures. We felt like it would be easier on the regulator and that was ultimately attracted to the NRC uh, as well. And uh, you know, our hope here was to streamline the construction schedule and uh, speed up the turnaround of any reviews that the NRC may need and any approvals that we might need from them. Uh, again, just to minimize delays. <clears throat> We all know changes are necessary, whether you're in part 50 or part 52. Um, and, and what I'll say is that the, the regulator, first and foremost, has been very supportive of our, of our efforts here. And they've done some things like the uh, preliminary amendment request, it's a, or what we call a PAR. And we've leaned on it a, a number of times to be able to get preliminary approvals on LARS and continue construction work or fabrication work at risk while the NRC is looking at, uh, looking at the request to see if it's something that they will approve. Um, but it has been something that has, uh, has improved turnaround times and allowed us to keep working uh, in the cases where we need the NRC to give us a, give, give us a review. Um, the uh, the other thing I would say about this, and before I share an example with you in one of our licensing amendment requests, is that uh, the regulator and the owner really just have to work closely together. And I, I know that most, most operators that may be in the room right now or the other constructors and EPCs that may be in the room can say, yeah, that's a no-brainer. But if you have not attempted one of these uh, nuclear projects in quite some time, a new, a new build, um, just remember that that relationship with the regulator and the owner and the license holder uh, needs to be, be one that's very uh, a team, team driven, focused on the goals, as you've heard earlier, and uh, really, to, really to support each other. One, one of the examples on this CAO3 module, so this uh, IRWST, the in containment refueling water storage tank. We filed a law or license amendment request 13-018. And um, the purpose of it was to, uh, we, on the west wall structural module, which is also a part of the uh, structural wall for the shield building, uh, we needed to, to make some changes to horizontal stiffeners. And we also need to make some changes uh, to update our UFSR table, UFSR table, and um, also change out some stiffeners and things like that. And, um, you know, as a part of this, what I would say is, is that uh, in going through the fabrication process and getting it here and getting assembled, what we realized was is that we had some departures from uh, the material used, 
Uh, in one case, it was we had used carbon. Um, we'd use stainless when carbon would be um, would be acceptable. And in another case, we needed to add some stiffeners to this particular module once it was inside the uh, inside the building. And so, uh, again, the PAR process. We submit this LAR. We go through the PAR process. We keep working. Uh, again, it's at risk, but the NRC understands what we're doing. And meanwhile, we're supporting their reviews uh, ultimately to get their approval. So, uh, again, on modularization, th those are uh, those are two two slides. The previous slide I wanted to leave just some lessons that we learned about safety culture and contingency and risk planning. And then here, uh, just having that relationship with your regulator and understanding uh, how to minimize schedule delays in dealing with your regulator. And then if we can see the next slide, again, as I mentioned, we, we have a, um, an owner support, support company, uh, what we call Southern Nuclear Services. This in one slide basically gives you an idea of how we can help other owners and how we're currently working with other owners who are either committed to building or in that uh, market study space where they're looking to think about, okay, what, what risk do we have here and how do we manage these? Um, uh, you can see in the circle that we, uh, again, identify risk. We can help with organization planning. Uh, if you're looking to think about uh, project delivery models, what does that mean in contract space and the risks that are there? Or if you wanna talk about regulatory and the, you know, the things that we've learned and what we do or how we do things differently, uh, we can certainly help with that, whether it's with the NRC or if you're in NQA1, um, maybe it's considering nuclear safety culture, those types of um, project management challenges, you know, we would love to help you. So certainly reach out and uh, if we can be of assistance, you know, we, we would love to do that. And I believe that's the final slide that I have. But uh, thank you for allowing Southern Company and Georgia Power to participate today. And again, if we can help in any way, let us know. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Greg. Um, that that was really great to get uh, to to get your perspective um, from these projects. I really appreciate, in particular, the focus that you brought on. Um, project management, project coordination, relationships between the different uh, responsible entities, managing those relationships and, um, and really bringing down the delays that happen at the interaction between different entities on the project. Um, I, I'm gonna, I've got a cut, we've only got about mm, 15 minutes left for the panel. I've got a few different questions that I'd like to throw out actually to all uh, three panelists. So uh, my first question is going to be around um, uh, quantifying cost savings uh, and whether any of you, um, uh, Greg from, from Georgia company, Georgia Power Company, DDA from BTP or uh, Harry from KHNP. Do you have a basis for, um, uh, for attributing specific cost savings to these different approaches, whether it's digital innovation, whether it's modularization, whether it's project management, or other aspects of, of how you've approached these projects. How do you know it's working? First to you, Greg. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, when it gets to uh, when it gets down to how do you know if your uh, if your cost management and if your uh, if the initiatives that, I'm just make sure I got the question right. If how do you know your initiatives are actually working right? And, and my answer to that would be that uh, this is something that me and my team are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you mentioned in my opener that we just recently in the last six to nine months completed hot functional testing on unit three. And uh, we're really getting to a point on Vogel three where the construction work is really done. Um, we, we do have some punch list work to go type items that we're burning down uh, we've still got testing to do on the uh, control system and INC space. Um, and we've still got uh, less than 100 ICNs out of 400 that we've got to get over to the NRC. 
for them to review. And that's on, again, that's on unit three. Um, so from the standpoint of is what we're doing, is it, is it working? Did we learn any lessons? Did the cost initiatives that we put in place, it, it, you know, can, can we really reap the benefits? My perspective on that is, and what I'm doing today is we're, we're really looking at unit four versus unit three. It's, it's, a, it's what's happening in unit four and what happened in unit three. What are we doing today on unit four to take lessons that we learned you know, specifically around, uh, and, and again today, in electrical space, if, if anybody's done any homework on Vogel three and four, they probably know that in the last 12 months we had uh, challenges with IEEE. It's our electrical code uh, in 384 in that particular code. And um, it gets down to spacing in general around conduit and it gets down to spacing with electrical cables and those types of things and, and particularly their relationship to other equipment in the plant. And so from, and that was particularly on unit three, that's where we picked up on it from a quality perspective and with a regulator. And so, you know, the question today is, are we better on unit four than we were on unit three? And in, when I look across the project and, and we look at our field engineering teams and our quality teams and we look at our oversight teams, you know, the, the thing that I have to that I have to convince myself is, is that we're not making similar mistakes on unit four than we made on unit three, because we know that the quality challenges will then lead to schedule delays and ultimately get back to your question, which was about cost. And so, you know, I, I think uh, in structural space, as we were building coming up out of the ground, we, we did that pretty well in capturing lessons learned on unit three and making sure that we didn't have those problems on unit four. An example comes uh, that comes to mind is back in 2012 and 13, we had some, uh, we, we had rebar challenges. Our rebar in the field that we had installed did not match the DCD, our design control document. And uh, this was on unit three as we're getting ready to pour first nuclear concrete. And um, you know, the the, the thing that we had to do was learn from that. It was a six month minimum delay in getting to first nuclear concrete. And, and then how do we get what we learned into the work packages, get the, get the design documents updated, get the work packages updated, such that we don't make those mistakes on unit four and ultimately bear the cost and the delay that we had on unit three. And so, you know, look, those are a couple of examples, a uh, long way around answering your question, but I, I, I do think for me, that's, that's a day-to-day -day assignment. And it's something that my team looks at and I kind of challenge our project management team with uh, making sure that we don't make those same mistakes. And so you, you probably look at it different if both units were online, but I'm kind of in the battle every day, but, but great question and thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And more or less the same question to DDA. I think we, it's fairly easy. Well, maybe it's not that easy, but I think it's easier uh, when something goes wrong to know uh, what was it that went wrong that caused a cost overrun or a cost delay. Um, but when you are avoiding cost overruns and avoiding cost delays because you have brought to bear the right combination of digital um, innovation of project management, um, uh, rigor, discipline, safety culture, uh, modularization, advanced manufacturing. How do you know what's working and where you should be putting your, uh, your uh, efforts? How do you attribute um, that you have driven down costs and risks um, through the right deployment of uh, resources into these different types of innovation? Uh, DJ? Uh, in fact, uh... We, we mainly speak in terms of, uh, of uh, schedule, of program. Uh, the, the, the cost, uh, mo the, mo the modularization has no impact, uh, direct impact on the cost, I would say. It's uh, uh, built in situ or, uh, or modularized. Uh, there is no modification on the cost, but the impact on the schedule is huge. And uh, so, uh, and, the, and the impact also on the risk of the schedule. It's not uh, the direct, um, it, uh, the modularization allow to de-risk uh, the, the schedule. So um, I think that uh, the question is not the cost, it's the schedule. Uh, and, uh, and after for, the, for digitalization, 
uh, it is the same thing. Uh, digitalization uh, is good because uh, uh, we have a better follow-up of, um, of uh, from the design to the construction. And, uh, and in addition, uh, uh, we are able to 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 declash uh, to 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 anticipate uh, much more carefully uh, the work. And so, it's, uh, uh, at, at the end, uh, it's uh, it's easier. So uh, uh, we 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 have we, we we are able to see the difference between Flamanville, where uh, where we got um, the the current uh, uh, nuclear project uh, rebar uh, ratio uh, and we have the same uh, approximately the same rebar ratio on uh, on nuclear project but this re uh, this reinforcement uh, uh, was uh, was uh, built in 3d uh, before uh, before the construction and uh, fully the clash and uh, and we, we have seen that uh, the quantity of uh, of fcr uh, uh, to 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 modify the, the reinforcement in situ uh, decrease a lot and so the the, the risk on the schedule uh, decrease a lot it is um, I don't know if I answer. Uh, Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, and Harry, the same question for you. Your presentation really um, showcased um, great examples of um, safety culture, the application of safety culture, quality control, um, the integration of project management with digital transformation and modularization. Um, which of these aspects do you think is, um, whether it's, it's schedule delays or cost overruns, which are largely the result of schedule des delays. What is the most sensitive piece of this? Which is the piece of it that, that keeps you up at night the most? What do you worry more about? Is it um, the impacts of, of design completion or is it project management or is it a different aspect? So um, at the end of my slide, I attached the uh, supplementary slide. Uh, so if you can pull up the slide, it would be helpful. But uh, if I talk about that uh, from my handout here, so there are many aspects that can be of help to save cost and make the schedule on time. So uh, among them, uh, I would say the design maturity is very important and proven supply chain and skilled labor workforce is also very important. And the inclusion of fabricators and constructors, uh, which is the part of the project management uh, area is also important. And I'd like to emphasize uh, for the a single primary contract manager with proven expertise, so which we pursue uh, very strongly and establishment of contracting structure and adoption of contract administrative processes uh, for allowing for rapid and non-litigious adjustment to unanticipated changes. Uh, and these things are the key drivers for cost savings and um, uh, the keeping the schedule on time. So, uh, Digital innovations or digital solutions are important in terms of uh, making it happen. But uh, the basic things for the success of the project, I mean, attributes for successful project uh, are from these factors. I excerpted it from the report from the MIT interdisciplinary study. So it shows the attributes for successful new build. So it doesn't mention much about the digital innovation thing, but uh, these things are most of the things I'd like to emphasize for uh, avoiding cost overrun and schedule delay. Thank you. I, thank you so much, Harry. Um, we have only five minutes left, so I'm going to, I mean, one last question and we'll go through all three of you, Harry, then DDA, then Greg. Um, my question is this. Um, to get from FOAK or first of a kind costs to, um, to nth of a kind costs, um, we have to come down the learning curve, which means we need a programmatic approach and frankly repetition. And we all sort of have this idea that there's two things going on as we, as we go down this learning curve. Number one, there's repetition and 
there are benefits to standardization and to just repeating the project. Don't tinker with the design, just repeat, repeat, repeat. And, and, and you learn by doing. But the, the other thing that happens from FOAK to NOAK is learning. And so learning implies that you're going to correct mistakes, or you're going to make improvements or enhancements as you go from one project to the next. How do you strike a balance between the desire to be standardized so that you can just you know, repeat, 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 and the desire to make improvements in every project. Because I think we all have, uh, have uh, uh, examples of engineers wanting to always learn and improve the design at every opportunity and change the design from one project to the next. How do you strike that balance? Uh, first, uh, Harry, then Didier, then Greg. So thank you for the question. So we Korea, uh, as I mentioned, we Korea have constructed 12 units of OPR 1000, the same type of reactor over the past uh, several decades. And then also we are, we have constructed or being construct being constructing 10 units of APR 1400. So it actually verifies that uh, shows that the repet repetitive uh, construction is very helpful uh, in mitigating avoiding uh, potential risks risks so uh, the standard standardization is very uh, meaningful in terms of cost saving and uh, schedule and avoiding schedule uncertainty uncertainty but as uh, you mentioned uh, we would like to adapt some new technology and we have a desire to uh, advance our nuclear technology. So when we adapt new technology and would like to build first of a kind uh, nuclear reactor, uh, we need to be, we need, we need to um, get prepared to adapt those technologies by doing some uh, essential task and experiments to avoid any possible uh, unexpected situation. And we need to do analyze uh, as much as possible uh, so that we can mitigate any possible, uh, uh, possible risks. And also uh, for those things, we have and we, we are investing a lot of research and development uh, resources uh, to make sure that the first of a kind nuclear reactor is safe and um, we don't have any further risk uh, when we are constructing first of a kind engineering reactor. Thank you, DTA. Yes, uh, in fact, yes, uh, I work on three projects, uh, OL3, FA3, and HPC. It is the same uh, EPR normally, but uh, I would say that it is a three uh, first of a kind uh, project uh, because, uh, because there's three projects, uh, the, 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 the time uh, between each pro project was too long. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, the the designer, uh, the country uh, uh, were different. So, uh, so, so at, at the end, uh, the three project uh, was uh, first of a kind. So, um, but but sure, uh, re replication is is a, is a key. Uh, it's uh, the key, and uh, especially from a civil a civil war point of view. Uh, between uh, HPC uh, Unit 1 and HPC Unit 2, uh, we try as more as possible to keep the same, the same design, the same method, everything. And if we want to modify, if we have to modify something from Unit 1 to Unit 2, uh, it's really because something was very bad and don't, don't work, uh, didn't work on Unit 1. Because we know that each time that we modified something, uh, it's really difficult to see all the impact. So I would say it's, it's better to do two times uh, something uh, not ideal, but at least we, that we know 
than to try to modify and to and to face another another problem not anticipated. So it <laughs> so it's for that that uh, full replication it's uh, it's uh, really uh, the, the, the best uh, the best solution. After uh, I speak from a civil war point of view, um, I know that uh, the, the problem is for the equipment uh, process. Uh, because uh, they, they, they have to modify their equipment, they have to, 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 to update their equipment. And, and uh, each time uh, it's, it's really, really difficult to, to avoid that uh, the subdate of equipment uh, uh, had an impact on the, on the civil work design. But uh, <laughs> we, we have to, to, to avoid. <laughs> Thank you, Didier. Over to you, Greg, for the final word on how to transfer lessons forward from one project to the next and still get down to that NOAK. Thanks, thanks, Deanne. Thank, thanks again for having this debate. Look, I, I agree with what Harry and, and Didier have said. I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really, uh, wouldn't really change anything that that they've said. Uh, two, two points to leave you with. One, um, if you're going into a project. Uh, to, 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 build, to build a new nuclear plant and there are existing designs that are working currently and your technology provider has proven that they can make megawatts with nuclear safety in mind, then you know, do, buy it off the shelf from them with minimal change and make the changes over the life of the plant if that's what you wanna do. You know, that, that's what I would say. And then, and then secondly, you know, lean, lean on people like the three panelists here um, that have have been in these projects, that have operated these plants. You know, in Southern Company, we have close to 8,000 megawatts. When Vogel 4 comes online, we've got eight units. Um, and, you know, we we have learned things from the last century and from, and, and in, again, in building this, this century that, that can be of help, specifically with our two units, as we were looking to buy the AP-1000, we looked at the, the history of our fleet to see what was mandatory for us to have in these units. We knew the Chinese had built the AP-1000 and that the technology would work. Um, looking back on it, I would, I would push to have, you know, an off the shelf kind of model and then let's make the changes going forward through the 60 years of runtime with these units. Because like these guys have said, the more changes that you make, the more complications you bring into design procurement and with the craft people that are trying to build it in construction. And so that would be my two things, you know, lean on the people that have done these things and buy it off the shelf as much as you possibly can. Thank you again for having Southern Company. Thank you for having me today. It's been a great, great for the panelists and participants. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, to all of our three panelists and uh, to the questions that I wasn't able to get to. I tried to pull from the Q&A screen into the discussion today. Uh, we weren't able to get to all the questions um, to our three panelists. If you have a little time to look at the Q&A and provide some answers, I'm sure that our audience would be very grateful. And with that, a big thank you and back to you, Antonio. Apologies for running five minutes late. It was a very interesting discussion. Thank you, Dian, and also thank you all the panelists for this indeed interesting and, and intense discussion, as you said. Now uh, we are moving to the session two, which will build on, on what we heard, but now we will focus on, on a specific techniques. Some of them, again, build on digital technologies, other on proven approaches in other sectors. Uh, the objective, again, is to the risk, to accelerate reduce the schedule. Uh, so with that, I will now would like to introduce the moderator of the next session. This session is called Insights into Advanced Construction Manufacturing Techniques and is going to be uh, moderated by Mr. Hassan Charkas. Uh, Mr. Charkas is principal technical leader at the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI, um, and he leads uh, engineering and construction innovation for new plants at EPRI. Uh, he has more than 22 years of research, engineering, and leadership experience. So please, uh, Hassan, the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Antonio. Uh, can you hear me fine? Yes. Excellent. All right. So great discussions in session number one. And I couldn't agree more about, 
about the importance of construction and also the technologies that are uh, enabling having us to uh, be more efficient in construction uh, meeting schedule and cost. So the, the session number two title is Insights into Advanced Construction and Manufacturing Technologies or Techniques. We at EPRI, and I lead this area in the construction and, and engineering innovation, uh, my job is really to find uh, some common solutions and also construction technologies that can enable us to get to that, uh, to, to a more efficient uh, construction schedule and cost. One of the key APRI's document on this is, uh, which is available on APRI.com for uh, free to download. It's called Economic Based Research on Development Roadmap for Nuclear Power Plant Construction, which highlighted, in fact, the importance of the discussion of today's session on construction technologies, labor efficiencies, designs of civil structural, and a big word, constructability. So today we have great, uh, uh, great uh, speakers. Uh, I'll start with uh, Dr. Goem uh, uh, Ever Sokrigan. I apologize if I mispronounce your name, uh, Dr. Goem. Uh, Dr. Goem is an, an expert uh, research engineer at EDF's R&D. He's previously worked at EDF's National Nuclear Equipment Center on the design and construction of EPR reactors in France and abroad. His fields of practice uh, are on the dynamics of structures and the optimization of reinforced concrete structures. Uh, Dr. Gum holds a PhD in uh, civil engineering from the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Cachan. Uh, uh, so, uh, Gum, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction. So, um, I, I'm not sure that, okay, that's perfect. The slide I, I shared. So, thank you so much. So, I try to um, uh, have uh, my contribution to that today. Uh, maybe we can switch to the next slide. So um, I will first start with a few uh, with a few words regarding some cost drivers, um, and especially uh, take benefit of some recent publications. Um, if we look at is on the left hand side of the screen regarding total of not costs, uh, there is something that is quite interesting. It's um, uh, exhibiting that nuclear and hydropowers present more or less the same range of overnight costs compared to other uh, sources of energy. Um, that is, uh, I may say, funny uh, when you consider that every dam is unique each time and it's not uh, generally the case for a series of nuclear power plants. So it can be considered for the every year for each dam as a first of a kind uh, except it's not uh, the same when there is a series of nuclear power plants. If we look on the right hand side uh, at the investment costs as a function of design completion, we see a direct proportionality in between those two elements. So it leads me to uh, the key that it would be um, interesting to provide the means of increasing design maturity and making first of a kind less first of a kind. So let's talk about that. So maybe we will start with the next slides in talking about uh, the current state of the arts. Uh, first, regarding design and construction approach, that is in fact uh, still too compartmentalized, too compartmentalized, sorry, due to lack of appropriate tools. What I mean by that is that we got a lack of digital means at the service of the extended enterprise. What I mean by extended enterprise is a concept that consists in putting all together in the same aquarium, every contributors, the owner, the, the architects, the constructor, and the designers, in order to make them work intelligently all together. Um, the, the issue is that we have no shared modeling calculation and site preparation tool in order to give uh, um, some uh, benefits to uh, that extended enterprise. There is a multitude of non-interoperable tools. Also, we got the beam, but the beam is not interfaced with the calculation model. We have many, many um, operations that are carried out in order to generate the calculation model. It's very complex, it's time consuming, and also it does not let you carry out some changes easily. We got the, all the constraints of the construction sign that are well known by the constructor, but generally they do not get upstream 
to designers. And also, they don't have reliable indicator the designers of the level of constructability of their design to guide their potential choices. So let's go to the next slide to have an overview of the state of the art regarding um, the design calculation. They have not benefited or very little from all the mechanical and numerical advances of the three to four decades, uh, past decades. Especially when you look at the reinforcement design, it's something that is like still too conservative, especially uh, with methods that are not suited to uh, provide a systematic optimized approach, especially when you look at the massive parts. And also in the cylinders, you've got something that is too local and that uh, needs to um, carry out some smoothing with subjective and often discussed methods. And at the end, you have, in fact, no optimization. There is no iteration in that aspect. So in the next slide, we have the opportunity to see the, what I may say, the, the two key objectives, the two, key two priorities that you will have to focus on if we want to improve the design in order to improve the construction. We've got two aspects. On one hand, left hand side, the digitalization of the civil engineering. This means creating a virtuous, virtuous loop in between the digital mockup, the calculation model, the drawings, the construction site, in order to make it completely fluid. But it will not solve the complete equation if we do not bring in that optimization techniques. If first, without talking about optimization, considering more realistic finite element model. They have not evolved since four decades. It's always plates, 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 even when they are not appropriate. And besides that, if you change the way you model, you have also to change the way you calculate the reinforcements and to account for massive areas as what they are. And also when you carry out the calculation of thin parts of plates, you have to change the scale at which you're, you're working and then also to use a big background of mechanical assumptions. So in the next slide, we have the two objectives that can be considered in order to translate concretely these priorities. First is to reduce cost and duration of the design by providing tools that will help people to have a fluid management of the options at the beginning and the changes during the phase of design, detailed design, executive design, and so on. This means considering relevant optimized calculation model and by making them automatically generated based on the digital model, based on the beam. Today, there is nothing in that. We can talk, it later, talk about that later. Also, the idea is to integrate into the digital model all the information that are necessary for the calculation and the establishments of the drawings. This means upgrading the beam formats. Besides that, also, there is a need for reduced cost and duration of the construction by optimizing reinforcement, optimizing not reducing necessary, because it's not obviously uh, the, the idea to have a patchwork of less reinforcement that you have something maybe more standardized and more homogeneous in order also to have um, and also to provide a better, a better integrating constructability integrators into the process. So this means reliable constructability indicators that are available as soon as the conceptual design started. This means also more realistic calculation model and adapted and optimized calculation of reinforcements, where you can, in fact, have something that is more and more reliable so that you can have a true idea of what is the merging and not saying, OK, there is merging. What is the amount of merging? I don't know. We'll see that later. That's not the good answer. So in the next slide, I provide here an idea of building uh, the uh, surrogate model in order to get the um, constructability indicator. 
it's um, an approach that we are uh, currently carrying out at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure, at Saclay, with some students and some uh, partners. The idea is to start with a set of element uh, of properties of an array, I may say, uh, in the design area, safety requirements, the construction solution that you can consider, what, where you are, what are the materials, what are the loadings. Then we, you will train a surrogate model. Sorry for the French meta model word, so it's surrogate model. The idea is to try to link the result of simulation, why? That is in fact consisting of reinforcement amount, geometrical properties, and also to build systematically with a lot of um, situations, if cases, based on the feedback of recent projects, based on the cost estimate by experts, opinion, based on site rec analysis, based on assessment of deadlines, you pull that in the blender and you generate also, based on all these expert opinions, based on different solutions and results of calculation, a Z array consisting of the time of construction, the cost, and the risk that is associated to it. This will be used to train a surrogate model. And at the end, the ID, the graal, <laughs> will be, the holy grail, will be to get a set of quantities of interest that are the schedule duration, the raw material cost, the overnight cost, and the risks directly based on safety requirements, construction size solution, and so on. And you then, uh, in fact, get rid of the facts that you are a true first of a kind. You, you change the first of a kind that you are based on all this feedback that you are integrating it. And then you can get the picture out of what it will be when you carry out some changes or when you consider new architecture options. So in the next slides, what uh, we can see is uh, an idea of the consequences, what, what may be the automation or in order to better the mechanical modeling. Here, in fact, it consists in mixing the beam format with new structural properties with an AI guided recognition of structural parts. Then you generate what I call an hybrid model. And if we go to the next slide, we can see the benefit that you can have with that because we have carried out some tests considering that uh, structural uh, mechanics uh, consideration. You have in blue, in the curves, you have the current practice and in orange, you have this evolution. And on the left-hand side, you have the both models. You see that you get an optimization regarding the qualification of equipment, design of carriages, and the simplification of the reinforcements. In the next slide, you have also an example of what it could be in order to, to appropriately carry, carry out and automatically, this is very important, to carry out the, um, the calculation of massive parts. It's using um, um, a structural optimization for certain type generation. With that, you can remain in the current practice of using automatic calculations, but with something that is upgraded in internal structural mechanics. Next slide, you have the other ID, but for the thin parts, you will not smooth a posteriori the quantities of reinforcement. You will generate panels where it is appropriate to consider an homogenization of the reinforcement. And what you can see on the right hand side is the consequences in terms of relative distribution of the amount of reinforcement, uh, reinforcement sections in a different uh, direction and uh, ways. So in the last slides, what I propose to, as a matter of conclusion, is some punchline, very easy. <laughs> building complex, it's something simple. We, we know that because we make it. But building simple is complex. And building simple is something that will be safer, maybe as, as safe as it is, but easily, it will be easy, more easier safe. When we spend time, during design, we will save time at the end. All, all the, the aspects I propose to make it more fluid, to make it quicker, it's not to um, 
make uh, fast and uh, not need the design, but to take the time to embrace every possible possibility to have something that is better and to take benefit of all the feedback. At the end, we will spend less time on site. So the evolution that has to be carried out to help engineers is something that will be will help them to focus on tasks where they have they have their added value, architecture, process, and not wasting their time in trying to solve unoptimized practices adapted to changes that are too late considered. So the, the idea may be to work on intensive digitalization in order to help co-engineering. This means interoperable digital solution that will involve new optimization techniques and improvements in modelings, uh, in modeling methods. So that, that was the, the purpose of my talk. So I, I'm, I've reached the end, I'm over. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Guillaume. Thank you, appreciate it. So we're gonna hold the questions until the end so we can have all, give the opportunity for all presenters to present today. So Guillaume, I'll come back to you at the end of the session. Thank you so much. All right, yeah. our next uh, speaker uh, is Dr. Bassam Burgan. He is a director of the Steel Construction Institute, uh, which is uh, a leading independent provider of technical expertise to the steel construction sector. Uh, Dr. Burgan is a visitor, is a visiting professor at City University of London and guest professor at South China University of Technology. He has a PhD in structural steel. Uh, Dr. Burgan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Hassan. I hope uh, you can hear me and you can see the, the slides. I can hear you and I can see the slides. Thank you. Excellent. OK, well, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak at this uh, event. Uh, the topic of my presentation is steel plate concrete structures. Uh, and that's a form of modular um, construction which enables a number of site operations to be eliminated, more construction activity to be moved into factories. And by doing this, of course, it's possible to do more par parallel working. Um, so to progress work more quickly, uh, it leads to less site congestion, but better quality control under factory uh, controlled conditions. And so overall, greater de-risking of projects. Uh, my presentation is in three parts. I'm going to describe what I mean by uh, steel plate concrete composite construction, so the structural form. Um, it's not a new form of construction. It's been around for many years. And so I will show a number of examples from previous applications. And I will finish with a few words about a project which I'm currently coordinating, looking at developing uh, buildability expertise in this form of construction. This is what steel plate concrete uh, structures look like. It's made up of two steel plates. There are uh, these short bars, which we call shear studs welded to each plate. And then the um, space between the uh, two plates is filled uh, with concrete. And this is a form of construction that we typically use for vertical elements. So, uh, for example, walls. When it comes to floors, we tend to use single plate with stiffeners, T stiffeners, to give the plate rigidity. And these shear studs, uh, similar to those that we saw on the walls. Uh, the purpose of these shear studs is to ensure that the steel plate acts compositely with the concrete. And the idea is that you build modules in a factory to the largest site, a size that you can transport. You can then assemble those modules together, either near site or on site, and then assemble them finally into the structure uh, using the largest size modules that uh, are, is possible to handle. Now, as I said, this form of construction is made of two steel plates, uh, those shear studs and concrete in between. Uh, but if you're taking these to site, uh, remember the, the, the uh, structure is not concreted when you move it from factory to site. And so those plates are not really easy to handle because they are very flexible. So what you do is 
you join the plates together in the factory to give you a more rigid module that is easier to handle, to lift, to transport, and to move around. And there are several ways of doing this. Uh, you've got four examples on this slide. First one is with bars that are welded to both plates. The second example below it is with the bars bolted, so there are holes through the plate and the bars are bolted. Uh, some manufacturers have used continuous ribs that run along the module. Others have used a sort of truss arrangement between the plates. The idea is to join the plates together. And this is quite challenging because the space between the plates is limited. So any operation that you're going to perform between the plates needs to take account of, of the limited space uh, that is available. Otherwise, you do it from the outside. So those welded bars, for example, they you, you could drill holes through the plate and then weld the bars from the outside rather than to try and weld uh, internally where there is no space. And here are two examples of actual uh, modules that have been fabricated. On the left hand side, you can see a double skin module with the two plates and the bars here are welded from the outside. You can see the positions of the welds and an example of a single uh, skin module used for floors with the plate and the T-stiffeners. The other thing to think about is that those modules have to be joined together um, on site. And there are different ways of doing this. There are three examples on this slide. One is the use of butt welding. So you've got a module one with these stabbing guides welded to it. The second module is brought along and is guided by those stabbing guides into, into position. And then the small gap between the modules is butt welded. Another example, which is more uh, tolerant in terms of fabrication tolerances, is the use of fillet welds. So you've got longer guide plates. Uh, the two welds shown in black are made in the factory. And then once you've assembled the two modules together, you can uh, make the final fillet weld to, to join the modules. And the third example uses mechanical um, connections. So it's bolting the modules together. The module two on the right is, is exactly the same as in the case of the fillet welded uh, modules. But in this case, uh, we are bolting the two modules together uses, using what's called blind uh, bolts. Uh, which enable you to bolt, from, to bolt from one side only. Now, why is there interest in this form of construction? They, they offer a number of advantages. This, the steel plate, in essence, performs four different uh, functions. First is it acts as reinforcement to the concrete. The second is uh, it acts as, as permanent formwork, so you eliminate any temporary formwork that you would otherwise uh, required for reinforced concrete. The steel plates act as a watertight membrane, which may be something important for certain ap applications, like, for example, the, the pools in a nuclear power plant. And lastly, uh, the, the, plate, the steel plate eliminates the need for any embedded plates. And, and I'll, I'll just explain this a little bit more. Uh, this is a picture of a, a typical space within a nuclear power plant, and all these patches that you see on the ceilings and the walls are what's called embedded plates. Now, these look something like this. They are steel plates with studs welding, welded on the back, and they are used to provide support to mechanical and electrical equipment, equipment in, in the plant. They have to be fitted into the reinforcement in the reinforced concrete structure. And there are typically somewhere between 90,000 and 100,000 of these on a nuclear power project. Fitting these into the reinforcement is very problematic because of the congestion uh, that the reinforcement presents. And when you hit problems with clashes, uh, they are quite difficult to resolve. Now, when you have a steel plate as your wall, with studs behind it, anchoring it into the concrete, the need for this type of arrangement is completely eliminated. So it, it removes an operation that is very complex and time consuming on site. 
I'm now going to go on to examples from the past. And the first one, this is the earliest example that I am aware of, of the use of this form of construction uh, in the nuclear sector. Uh, and you can see the double skin walls and the single skin floors uh, being used here uh, on a power uh, plant in, in Japan. The second example is also from Japan and it's a bridge structure. And in this case, the designers have used uh, two steel plates with ribs between them. And again, you can see the shear studs to, to uh, anchor the plates into the concrete and ensure composite action. And this was chosen because it gave the a constructor, the, fa the, the uh, contractor, a working surface uh, on the bridge uh, immediately uh, usable as they were constructing the bridge during construction. Uh, this is also in an environmentally sensitive area and this form of construction enabled the thinnest possible deck for the bridge to be achieved. A third example, well, we've already uh, had a, an excellent presentation in the first session on, on Vogel. And this is a picture taken from uh, Vogel and it shows the AP1000, um, some of the AP1000 modules that are constructed out of uh, double skin modular construction. And this is probably uh, the best example of the use of uh, this form of construction in the nuclear sector at, at present. And another really impressive example is a building that was completed in 2020. This is Rainier Square uh, Tower in Seattle in the USA. And, and this is a project uh, that the, the economics of the project came into question and the project was almost canceled at one point. Originally, it was designed in reinforced concrete. And one of the issues with the use of reinforced concrete for the building core is that the core is on the critical path it controls the speed at which the construction of the building can, can proceed. Nothing can go faster than the core can, can be built. This slide shows uh, the construction sequence on the left-hand side in reinforced concrete and on the right-hand side using SC construction. And in reinforced concrete, you start by building a number of levels of the core, and then the structure around the core follows. So this is going up in reinforced concrete. The structure around it might be steel beams and columns. Um, you then have to build the next section of the core, then the um, uh, floors, uh, columns and beams and so on follow and so on. With SC construction, the core and the structure allowed uh, around it go up together. And then the concreting follows afterwards. And what was possible in this project was that an original construction program for the structure that uh, was prepared and which uh, was estimated to take 21 months was then achieved in only 10 months using SC construction. So this, this is a, a, a real uh, project. It was constructed, finished, it used SC construction, and this is what was achieved. So now for the final part of my presentation, uh, just a few words about a current European project. This is funded by a grant from the European Commission, uh, the Research Fund for Coal and Steel. Uh, there are a number of partners working on the project, which you can see listed on the left-hand side. Uh, the project is also receiving industrial funding from a number of companies listed on the right-hand side. And the aim of the project is to uh, develop construction expertise in this form of construction and to generate data on the cost and time uh, that it takes to, to work using this form of construction. The building that we have chosen to construct is a replica of the EDF diesel generator building. You can see a few pictures of that in reinforced concrete. The diesel generator building um, is, is one of the post Fukushima additional safety measures that have been introduced and EDF in France have built over 50 of these buildings on their various uh, nuclear sites in, in France. Uh, the building footprint is 24 meters by 12 meters, and the height to the top of concrete is about 15 meters. 
So it's a building that is large enough to explore the manufacturing and construction techniques at full scale, but small enough to be feasible within the budget of a demonstration project. It also has the benefit that there is so much data available within EDF about how long it takes, how much it costs to build this in reinforced concrete. So we have something that we can then compare with uh, when we've completed our building using SC construction. The building uh, in our project has been designed in detail. We have used uh, BIM extensively. You can see the uh, building information model uh, here for uh, the, detailed, uh, the, the detailed design of the building. And we have so far completed the manufacture of most of the modules. Uh, so uh, that's the stage we are currently at. We have done in the factory uh, some um, uh, trial assembly. And the purpose of the trial assembly has been two things. One is to ensure that the construction tolerances that we have specified um, for the fabrication are sufficient for assembling the structure together. And the other, to test a number of ancillary components that we've introduced to facilitate the assembly of the structures uh, on site. And this is a very short video that shows you the trial assembly. Okay, and um, where we are at now is site work is just beginning. Uh, the building is going to be constructed at one of EDF's a site, Le Renardier, uh, southeast of Paris. You can see on the map where it is relative to Paris there. This is the construction site shown uh, shaded in yellow. Uh, Bouygues are the contractor and they started recently on site with site preparations. Foundation construction is beginning now and modules for the first level of the building uh, will be delivered in uh, mid-April. So to summarize, uh, the mechanical performance of this form of construction has been studied for over 30 years. Now we know a great deal about it. We know that it is a very efficient form of construction. Uh, we know that mechanically it's extremely robust. The purpose of what we're doing now is, is focusing on quantifying the degree to which SC construction can de-risk a project by moving as much construction activity as possible from site into the factory and how much time can be saved in the process and what is the cost impact is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bessam. Really interesting presentation and I'll hold my questions and the questions from the audience until the end of the, uh, the presentations. Uh, Great presentation on SC wall technologies. Uh, the next presenter is uh, Dr. Steve Johns. Uh, Dr. Johns is the UK's Nuclear Advanced Manufacturing Research Center Chief Technology Officer and the University of Sheffield Professor of Joint Technologies with responsibilities for the strategic development and application of manufacturing engineering practices into UK's fission and fusion power communities. Is also the UK's Nuclear Waste Services Discipline Lead for Advanced Manufacturing Research. He's a fellow and professional board member of the Welding Institute, UK a delegated expert within the International Institute of Welding and UK Committee representative of ASME, Boiler and Pressure Vessel Sections 3 and 9. Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Hassan. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you um, for giving me the chance to actually uh, discuss some of the technologies that we're developing today, which hopefully will be of interest. Good day to you all and good evening. Um, could we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So as Hassan um, kindly introduced me there, um, I thought I'd just give a background to the Nuclear MRC, what our remit is. We are part of the University of Sheffield's Advanced Manufacturing uh, faculty. We're also part of the High Value Manufacturing Catapult Center, which is um, uh, uh, analogous to the Germany um, Fraunhofer Institute, where we um, 
We use a multiple set of centres around the UK on the right hand side of the slide that have over two and a half thousand personnel specialising in engineering, research, technician work, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, our main mission, as it says there, is to um, help UK companies win work in the nuclear and other high value manufacturing sectors, including the safety sector. And we do that through um, both our manufacturing innovation programs and supply chain development. And the, the, the typical assets that the Catapult sit on are around about 0.8 of a billion pounds worth of capital assets. So uh, we, we've got no excuse not to do good work, I hope. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So um, to understand uh, advanced manufacturing, we need to understand where we've come from and conventional practices that have been used since the 70s and 80s. And I thought I'd just share with you some of the work that my colleagues in the Sheffield Forge Masters community have developed for um, power plant around the world and other, other type of reactor systems. And as you can see, um, on the left-hand side, the conventional forging route um, produces simple uh, cost of material. It's, it's cheap in its way of manufacturing. There's nothing complex about that in its conventional term, but there are 12 connective points and 10 individual child parts if you wanted to break them down. So uh, we have a multiple set of situations where we've got some circumferential welds and longitudinal welds that subsequently need heat treating and inspection. And that is all adding time and variability into the process. Could you hit return please, Hassan? So um, what happens if we start to take Sorry, if, what happens if we start to take the, um, the technology that's on the left-hand side and look at it in conventional welding terms? Well, there is not much you can actually do with that. You, you can change the joint designs and you can change the processes. So I just thought I'd share with you typical joint designs that you find in a typical uh, ISO standard. Um, they equate to a, AWS A2.4 as well. Um, and as you can see there, if you use the um, gas tungsten arc welding process, the TIG process, or the submerged arc welding process, you can see the typical times that are, uh, are there to actually manufacture that suite of connectivity points. So 1,577 hours or 413 hours. Um, so quite a lot of processing time and inspection time to actually deal with there. Right, well, what have you got here? So. Imagine now if we took that conventional forging process and um, just use strategic parts of that and advanced it through those other forging processes that we've looked at with hollow forging um, and complement that with what we call um, powder metallurgy hipping. So the little bits of what we've got here uh, show that we take a, a powder typically analogous to a sandcastle making process that you probably did when you were a child on your local beaches. You force that into a compact um, steel casing, you place that in your pressure vessel, and you use inert um, gas to pressurize that to around about 15,000 to 29,000 PSI and at temperatures ranging between 60% and 80% of the melting point of that particular material. That allows diffusion, you compact it, and as you can see on the right-hand side, as your top right-hand corner, is a typical um, TEAG section that has been powder metallurgy hipped. So if you took that and then started to look at what are the programs we're working on at the moment, which is the uh, New Scale and EPRI program joint venture with ourselves, in um, a 0.4 scale um, SMR reactor, you can see that the middle section is showing the canister, the steel canister and the powder is actually inside that. Subsequently, if you use a joining technique, which I'll come on to in a minute, um, you can actually create two halves and therefore naturally zip them together as we call it. So join them and create a, a nice homogeneous structure. And the 40% scale up ahead below uh, is made of um, pressure vessel grade steel, uh, SA508 grade three class one. And it's actually got integral uh, 27 penetrations, which would normally be um, quite a large and complex welding um, operation, whereby you'd have to do a significant amount of uh, preparation and welding across those heads and that induces a lot of, a lot of stress and significant um, 
uh, manipulation stroke distortion of the product should that actually be done incorrectly. By taking those advanced forging practices and combining that with advanced forming processes such as the PM hip, and subsequently then use electron beam welding, we can join those together in a far faster time with a lot less variability and virtually no consumable material. Overlaying it, we can do that through what we call diode laser, and that minimizes disruption of the surface, and we can deposit between 1.6 millimeters and two millimeters in thickness with less than 10% dilution of the base metal. And that is very, very advantageous when you start to consider if you want to put overlaying um, into areas with thinner sections. But it means that once again, you've got far more articulation opportunity to create um, overlaying in those internal surfaces that's shown in the PM hip head, because they actually penetrate through and have some very complex profiles inside, which can be difficult to overlay. So what does that mean in, um, time and how do we manage that through the technology readiness level. So as we've seen on the left hand side, we've got that conventional forging route. We then follow the advanced um, RPV forging route developed by Sheffield Forge Masters. You can see the number of uh, connective points and subsequent weld joints are obviously reduced. That improves uh, homogeneity of the structure, improves properties. And naturally we've come down quite a lot on the processing time. But taking it to the next stage, if we then used electron beam welding, um, what you can see there is a dramatic drop in processing time. So instead of 1577 hours from the gas tungsten arc process, we can zip all those together in 18 hours. So that is a significant saving. Along the bottom also, you'll see that we, we've actually eliminated virtually two metric tons of consumable from the original um, setup. So we've gone down to no material required because we've set the joint in its very primitive form. It's two edges basically coming together, squeezed together, and subsequently electron beam welded in one shot. So we can penetrate anything up to 120 to 150 millimeters in one shot in the chamber. That subsequently means no material and a major saving on CO2 content because that's another part that we're trying to start to charter and move um, our analysis in, is how can we decarburize our processes as well as create technology that actually decarbonizes the world in its own energy sense. So some of this it cannot be done independently. So the the key thing here I want to show is the interconnectivity and the interdisciplinary of, of innovation. So we've just seen the 0.4 scale head that the steel top left hand um, image is, is that penetration form. We then use um, uh, machining processes that have um, supercritical CO2, which allows us to remove material a lot faster and without any significant coolant. So no surfaces are left with grease, they're actually dry. We have our in-chamber electron beam welding, and I'll come on to that in a sec. We can move those joints from those high stress regions to something that are far more manageable um, into certain, you know, typical circumferential joints, which we just deal with hoop and axial rather than just complex stresses through the whole component bulk material. And then we have to think about how we can actually start to weld these outside a chamber. So you potential to use localized reduced pressure systems that follow the component. So the component doesn't need a big chamber and a big footprint, but that in its, in its own right has difficulties with respect to it being bespoke materials and, and, stru and structures that need to obviously address the profile of what you're dealing with. We move down to inner integral vacuum chambers. That's something we're working on at the moment where the component actually becomes the actual vacuum chamber rather than actually requiring any external chamber. And then we move along with diode laser cladding and the use of in-process inspection to speed and eliminate uh, the need for complex and timely preheat and cool down sections and, and inspection sections that are going on that add time to the process procedure. And we're using artificial intelligence, both um, from a uh, artificial neural network standpoint, and we're using 
um, image-based systems as well as uh, support vector machine systems as well, which allow us to really understand how we can switch a defect on and off. And it's only when you can switch a defect on and off do you really know your process. Could I have the next slide, please, Hassan? So uh, what are we doing in, in, in trying to accelerate that through? We're changing our manufacturing philosophy in, in its own right. We're taking the um, cross-sectoral um, ideas. So we're looking at automotive automation, um, building things uh, on a uh, metronomic type format, um, removing manual operations to more standardized and automate systems means we reduce variability in our products. We then, from that, will be able to create an aerospace accuracy and start to work and use that type of accuracy that ultimately gives us the nuclear integrity. And by triangulating that, we reduce the costs of um, product manufacture. We, um, in effect, going back to Didier's point in the very first session, we actually uh, reduce the schedule time. And if you were to carry out a in process repair using conventional arc welding, you'd have to do what we call a dig and TIG or a dig and weld process. With the electron beam welding process, we can just re-zip it around without actually uh, doing any zip, uh, any digging out of the structures. And that allows us to think about not being myopic, having this wider sense, because myopic silo manufacturing processes and principles have been around in the 20th century we can't afford to have those going into the 21st century so there's got to be this interoperable uh, connectivity not just in processes but in our community of practices and with our regulators etc cetera, etc cetera. and then the final bit is well you know if we can aid using these technologies to give our designers more freedom then we can help balance the challenge that we always face with one another, designing for performance versus designing for manufacturing. And the manufacturing has to step up to meet the performance requirements. We can't lower our performance and degrade on our properties without actually trying to do more innovation in a, in a timely manner. Could I have the next slide, please? So I, I think I just wanted to leave you with uh, the seven key drivers that um, have come out of our uh, in innovative program. And in, in, in summary, I'm, I'm not going to read those verbatim. Uh, I think you'll find that um, you'll get bored of me just talking all the time. But in short, um, innovation should not be perceived as a barrier to improvement. Um, Parallel processing and parallel developments and improved open dialogue will allow the nuclear sector to compete on the energy price scale. And wider industrial practices should be embraced um, and the supply chain development in the culture of nuclear manufacturing needs to be brought along in parallel too, uh, to reduce the perceived insurmountable barriers that are sadly um, considered um, non-entry points to the existing market. And for that, Hassan, I hope I can myself within the 15 minutes as allocated. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Really interesting presentation. Uh, uh, I, I have a couple of questions for you at the end of the, the presentations. Uh, really interested in this golden thread. Uh, so I'll ask you a question about that. Uh, thank you so much. All right. Uh, uh, the, uh, we have a great presentation by uh, Ms. Ashley Finnan, uh, and Dr. Ashley is the Director of National Reactor Innovation Center and a, and a Division Director at Idaho National Laboratory in the U.S. Uh, in this role, uh, she is responsible for overseeing initiatives to provide resources to reactor innovators to test, demonstrate, and conduct performance assessments to accelerate the deployment of advanced nuclear technology concepts. Previously, uh, Dr. Finham uh, served as uh, executive director for the Nuclear Innovation Alliance and served as a director of nuclear innovation at Clean Air Task Force. Ashley, the uh, floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Hassan. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of what the National Reactor Innovation Center is, and then I want to share a couple of activities that we have um, ongoing that are, are relevant to the topic of this workshop. So 
Um, it's been really um, fascinating to listen to the, the prior presenters and I hope that some of what we're doing will show um, how we're implementing and demonstrating some of the key technologies and techniques that folks have identified as important to addressing cost overruns and, and schedule issues. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so NREC is a, a Department of Energy Office of Nuclear Energy Program. It's a national program centered at Idaho National Laboratory, but working across the United States with various labs. It was launched in FY 2020 um, and was authorized by the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act to accelerate advanced nuclear demonstrations. We really work to partner with industry. Um, we also work closely with the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear to help um, bridge the gap between the, the concept and research space and commercial deployment for advanced reactors. And a key, a key part of our portfolio is really trying to lever leverage the national lab expertise and infrastructure and ensure that those capabilities are available to demonstrators and accessible to them. Next slide, please. So our mission is to inspire stakeholders and the public to empower innovators to test and demonstrate their technologies through enabling access to infrastructure, capabilities, expertise, and materials, and to deliver successful outcomes through efficient coordination of partners and resources. And these are shown in a, a circular configuration because they're, they're very related. I, I think that as we empower the private sector, um, which is really the model we're pursuing in the United States right now, we'll be able to deliver those successful demonstration projects. And as we show that advanced reactors are not just a concept, but a reality that can contribute to addressing energy challenges, that will inspire um, and captivate those who are hopeful that advanced nuclear will play a role, but want to see proof that, that it's real and it works. And, and of course, that it's affordable and constructible. Next slide, please. Uh, we work to partner regionally and nationally to support demonstrations, and that's been our focus over the first two years of our, our program, but increasingly we're looking to, to partner internationally as well, and I hope that as we move through this year, um, we'll be able to, to establish some more international partnerships. Um, you'll see some international engagement in, the, in one of the projects I'm going to describe today, um, but, but we're an integrating um, function for, for the U.S. national lab and, and government resources and the private sector. As we try to empower innovators, we have really a, a pretty large menu of elements of our program. Um, and each of these is, is really a set of projects. I won't go into detail, but I wanted to give you a quick overview before I dive into the, the advanced construction projects. Um, so some of these are, are very relevant to digital engineering. One is demonstration test beds. We're working to take some existing facilities and, um, and really repurpose them so that innovators can bring in a demonstration reactor and put it in an existing facility, operate it, and, and move through that process quite quickly. And we can repeat that process in one facility at a national laboratory. Um, and have multiple demonstrations. So I'll show you a slide on that in a moment. And then we have some experimental facilities um, that are filling some gaps. Uh, we have a virtual test bed that takes some of the key modeling and simulation tools of the national labs and makes those applicable to advanced reactor demonstrations. We have some key work on regulatory risk reduction, working with the DOE, with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and on uh, NEPA. Um, National Environmental Policy Act activities. And then we have some, some planning tools for innovators and for communities. We can go to the next slide, please. So this is one of those demonstration test beds. It's the, the dome test bed, and it takes the EBR2 dome at IML, um, which operated a sodium fast reactor from 1964 to 1994. It was a 62 and a half megawatt thermal reactor. And what we're doing is we're taking this empty dome and repurposing it so that innovators can come in and demonstrate their reactors um, up to 20 megawatts thermal. So quite a bit smaller than the EBR2 was. And the reason that I wanna bring this up is that this is a really interesting integration problem. Um, we have a, an existing facility that needs a bunch of modifications and improvements and maintenance. And then we have, we're gonna develop this test bed 
Um, and then we have innovators from separate organizations with diverse designs who wanna hook up to that test bed and be inside it and use the heat rejection and, and use the various systems. And this is a, a um, really important application of digital engineering for us. We are implementing digital engineering throughout this project and many NREC projects because we see it as a key way to reduce silent errors, to improve communication among the engineering disciplines and to enable um, improved construction and design, as well as operations, maintenance, and ultimately decommissioning. And as we try to interface with an innovator, and especially when that innovator is changing, um, and so we're, we're pursuing this design while the innovator is, is developing their design, it's really important to be able to connect through digital engineering so that things don't get dropped. Um, so this is a place where we are really happy with, with what digital engineering does for us. And I wanted to emphasize that here. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. So what I wanna focus most of my remarks on today is our Advanced Construction Technology Initiative. Um, and this is an in initiative in which we're, we're working to significantly reduce construction costs and schedule associated with new nuclear builds. And in particular, um, ENRIC is focused on demonstration and, and what we've identified in looking at the literature and speaking with innovators and stakeholders is that there are a number of advanced construction technologies that are used successfully in other industries but haven't been deployed in a nuclear context. So ENRIC is not an R&D program. We don't want to do basic R&D. There are other organizations that do that. But what we do wanna do is identify um, that low hanging fruit where the technology is almost there. It's a small lift to make it available to innovators, but advanced nuclear developers aren't going to adopt new technologies that come along with significant regulatory risk or nuclear technology risk. So what we're doing here is looking these technologies that are used elsewhere, and we just need to take them and, and adjust them for a nuclear context and um, work with the regulator to ensure that the regulator has a path to being able to evaluate and, and inspect these and understands how these might be used in the future so that an advanced reactor developer or, or customer feels comfortable using these technologies that can make a big difference in construction cost and schedule. So our first project in this space is a partnership with uh, GE Hitachi as the lead. Um, and then a number of key subcontractors to GE Hitachi. So those include APRI that's doing work on digital twin and non-destructive evaluation techniques. Uh, the University of North Carolina at Charlotte also working on digital twin. The Nuclear Advanced Manufacturing Research Sense Center, um, which is working on advanced sensors in this project. Modular walling systems Holdings Limited, which is providing the steel brick technology that we're going to be um, testing and demonstrating here. Purdue University working on steel concrete composite prototype testing. Black and Veatch, which is helping us with boring technology and the construction of the demonstration, the decommissioning plan, um, the scaling prototype and the site selection. And then the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is an industry partner. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, I'll describe in a little more detail what we're, what we're doing here. Um, this is a, a, a two-phase project. So the first phase is one year, um, $8.35 million project that's cost shared. Um, it is about 75%, looks like Windows, Windows is gonna shut down in 10 minutes. Um, so I'll, I'll be quick, um, that'll keep me on schedule. The, it's a 75% DOE NE or NRIC cost share and then 25% roughly private cost share shared between GE Hitachi and Tennessee Valley Authority. That's phase one and that encompasses uh, the, some of the design work, a few early prototypes and um, some of the digital twin work as well as site selection and planning. And then phase two, if we're successful with phase one and have the resources to continue, that will include um, a scale demonstration of a few technologies that I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Um, and that cost estimate is being generated now, but it would similarly be something like an 80-20 or 75-25 cost share. So we kicked off this project in January of this year, and we're working towards GE, Hitachi, and the team are working towards a 30% design in May um, and a final design next January, as well as developing a risk register and a, a project work plan. So if you go to the next slide, please, that'd be great. 
So the technologies that are being demonstrated here are steel bricks, um, vertical shaft construction, and, and digital twin and advanced monitoring technology. Um, and I'm actually gonna start, um, I'm gonna go in order of, of when they happen. So the vertical shaft construction um, leverages best practices from the construction indus industry where vertical shaft boring machines are used to, um, to excavate the shaft that's needed for construction. And that is a departure from the traditional nuclear excavation, which is, is using heavy earth moving machinery, um, needing to excavate a much greater space than is really needed for the building, and then needing to replace that with engineered fill, which is quite costly and needs to be, um, needs to be quite exacting. A lot of advanced reactors are pursuing some partial or full subsurface installation. And so this vertical shaft construction is a way to achieve that subsurface installation that, that comes with safety and security benefits um, while also reducing the cost and time associated with excavation. Uh, but it hasn't been used in nuclear yet. So, so what we're gonna do here is demonstrate it and work with the regulator. Um, and then steel bricks would allow you to re reduce the labor and rebar welding in a traditional concrete um, approach. And this is something that is, is much more, it's modular and it's standardized and you can install it right within that excavated um, vertical shaft. However, it's been typically used in a rectangular configuration, not in a cylindrical configuration. So one of the tasks here is to, to um, develop the techniques and show that they're effective for using steel bricks in a cylindrical configuration that's more relevant to nuclear construction. And then we have a digital twin and advanced monitoring, monitoring technology scope, wherein a digital replica of the demonstration structure will be um, created and we'll be able to use monitoring sensors and things to, um, to see how the civil structure is, is um, performing. Um, next slide, please. So the construction and integration process for this project begins with preparation of the site, um, then excavation of that vertical shaft, placement of the mud mat foundation, then assembly of the fabricated steel brick technology from, from offsite fabrication, and then lowering those panels into the shaft, installing the sensors for the digital twin, um, and embedding the, the reactor structure and digital twin. So that's the big picture of how this would work and what we're gonna be testing. The steel bricks um, technology is a, a state-of-the-art system that's trademarked by Modular Walling Systems Holding Limited. Um, we're going to be doing prototype testing of representative panels to expand that fabrication no knowledge that as I described that that's really for rectangular structures we want to move towards cylindrical structures. Um, and then we have a, just a description here that steel concrete composite systems that are fabricated off site and filled with the concrete on site are faster to install than traditional concrete um, and have higher resistance to flexural stress damage. They prevent some of the spalling and buckling issues that we see and they improve the resistance to compression. So we have both lower cost and improved performance through these, these technologies. Next slide, please. Um, the vertical shaft structure, construction, as I described, it, it reduces costs associated with excavation. Our conceptual design for the scaled structure here is, is roughly an outer diameter of 16 meters um, shaft depth of five meters and a height up upgrade of two meters. Um, and then that'll be kept weather tight with a commercial roof. There's a potential here to reduce the amount of excava excavation and engineered backfill by about a million cubic feet. Um, Black and Beach is the lead on selection of the boring technology, the scaled structure and the site selection. Next slide, please. And then finally on the digital twin and advanced monitoring, monitoring technology, um, we want to demonstrate this in the context of a new civil structural approach for nuclear um, to show how we'd implement the construction and the surveillance programs to address NRC's regulatory re requirements. Um, it'll also allow us to, to demonstrate how um, sensor data and artificial intelligence and machine learning and data analytics could be used going forward in a structure like this. Um, so we have a mini digital twin being deployed by EPRI and UNCC based on a prototype at 
or on the prototype at Purdue to be able to collect the data and validate the sensor types that are going to be um, determined by NARMC. Um, and then I think that I don't want to go over time, um, but the goal here, as I said, is to, to utilize expertise um, from various innovators to demonstrate construction technologies that are not yet being used in the nuclear industry. And demonstrating these technologies in the context of NREC um, will build confidence with the developers, the regulators, and nuclear construction entities, as well as investors, that these are suitable for advanced nuclear use. Um, and if we can if we can get there, these techniques in nuclear builds will significantly reduce cost and schedule for new nuclear energy projects. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is just a little bit about NRIC's overall goals for FY22. We're working to maintain progress to support demonstrations by the end of 2025 and sustained innovation thereafter. We're doing that by preparing vital infrastructure like test beds and experimental work, providing planning tools and resources, demonstrating cost-cutting technology like digital engineering and advanced construction technology, anticipating and addressing regulatory needs through our work with the NRC and the Department of Energy, building and developing our team and strengthening and expanding partnerships and engagement. And as I described, um, we're looking to, to have both domestic partnerships and engagement and starting to work internationally as well in the coming year or two. So that, that, that's my last slide. Thank you very much, Hassan. I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Ashley. Very interesting presentation. I appreciate uh, you sharing all this information. So if I can have all the presenters turn on their cameras, please. Uh, this is the time for us to have a panel discussion. So I'm going to have, since uh, we're kind of short in time, so I'm going to have a specific question on each of you all presentations and then uh, a common question uh, for all the presenters. So I'll start with Ashley. Great presentation again. Uh, uh, I like the mission that you are looking for uh, technologies that are almost there to bring them over to nuclear and and, and actually demonstrate them. Great, great mission. Uh, so the big question I think in everyone's mind: How are you going to share the lessons learned of all those demonstrations and the test beds that you're doing uh, with the uh, advanced reactor innovators? Great. Yeah. Thank you for the question, Hassan. Um, we will be we will be working to develop some lessons learned documents um, and sharing some of those results as well as having peer reviewed publications coming out of the, the effort. Great. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So uh, I'll go over to uh, Dr. Jones. Uh, you you talked about those advanced manufacturing technologies and and how they can be used and all that. I think one of the big savings as well will be on uh, the operation and maintenance of all those components looking forward uh, to the operation time. Uh, in your opinion, how the industry uh, codes and standards need to be changed or influenced based on uh, what you are developing and how are you connected with those? And, and also how is the in-service inspections will look like in the future? Oh, thank you, Hassan. Yes, um, very, very um, challenging questions, I may add. There's, there's no easy solution to that. But um, I would probably um, bring it to three particular points. We, there, there needs to be a clear industrial incentive um, to uh, exist and, and therefore invest and embed in new technology. All work involving codes and standards, as we know, is done through a volunteer network. And so there's got to be some sort of focus group um, international focus group that starts to or drives towards code convergence and reconciliation um, because without that you just need you, I can't explain it too well that the global dialogue needs to be transparent and we realize that we need to capture very sensitive data that could be conceived as or perceived as um, mm -hmm. delicate data but that, that's what we've got to, uh, we've got to have that increased transparency and collaboration with development programs. And we've started to, uh, to address your inspection question. Um, when we start to look at more complex um, special processes and joining is one of those special processes and so is PM HIP because we're you know, obviously dealing with materials. Um, the goal is to naturally um, try and inspect in real time, but also um, if you can homogenize and create processes that in effect, and I use this term very carefully, in effect, make welds disappear on a macro scale, you can actually mm. extend the life and therefore the inspection periods. 
So we're, we're working on um, in increasing that confidence through exposing this uh, type of joint to radiation effects. So transparency, collaboration, and um, in-process performance assessment, sorry. Thank you, Steve, excellent, thank you. Uh, 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 Sam, I have a really good question on SC walls. I think there is, it's a, a promising technology it's for modularization. Uh, the big questions could be is on uh, how would you uh, 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 make sure that the concrete quality is good within those steel plates, especially that you cannot see the concrete in, 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 in this kind of construction. Uh, what kind of good practices they can share with us uh, in, in, on this uh, construction technology related to con concrete quality? Um, what we have found from trials is that when you're concreting vertical elements, concreting walls, there really mm -hmm. is no problem as long as, as you're using a, a normal mixed concrete with, with good grading of the aggregates and you vibrate the concrete uh, as, as you're concreting. We, we've done trials where we've then cut the uh, element afterwards to check the quality of the concrete and, and found absolutely no problem. Now, as you would imagine, if you're concreting a horizontal element, a floor that has two plates, you might worry about uh, air pockets or, or gaps below the top uh, plate. Again, we, we, we did some trials in the 1990s where we replaced the top plate by a perspex plate. So you uh -huh. can look at the, how the concrete is flowing and, and how it's, uh, what, what the state is. So you can see it behind the, behind the plate. And with horizontal elements, it is more advisable to use a flowable concrete mix. It is also uh, advisable to uh, ensure that the floor is concreted under some pressure. So if you're concreting a floor, you concrete it simultaneously with short walls either side. So there is a head of concrete that would then force any air bubbles out of the uh, floor. Uh, there are now technologies to test for um, uh, gaps in, in, in the concrete or for, for voids. I'm not sure that any of them is, is yet 100% reliable, but, but they are evolving and they're improving and getting better. Great, thank you. All right, uh, so William, uh, constructability, the big word in everyone's mind, uh, we need to get there. And as you said, good construction starts with a good design. And I, I like the methodology you're proposing is to have a constructability indicator for the design and how we can have the engineers focus on the stuff that is important and automate the rest of the stuff. The big question in my mind comes when you're presenting was, you have all this work up front. How would you deal? You always have this construction and design going to the plant, uh, but there would always going to be faced with changes and challenges in construction. How would you uh, backfit or have a methodology that would uh, quickly uh, uh, disposition construction findings during construction, not before construction and, and design? Uh, have, do you have any ideas on how that could be optimized as well? Because that's also a, a schedule delay big issue that we're facing in the nuclear industry. So the question, uh, if uh, correct me if I am, uh, yeah wrong uh, the question is uh how do you uh, will how, how will you manage the changes um yes. in that perspective and do, how do you um, evaluate the impact of changes yes the, during the construction or, so uh the during the construction enter uh, operability and then potentially digitizing the whole process how is that going to be helpful for addressing changes in construction during construction so um, in order to try to capture that, uh, I think that the um, the, the key uh, the of the of the job is what I have presented based on the surrogate model um, mm -hmm. that that is used in order to generate uh, the, uh, the the indicator. The idea, in fact, we have started to work with some partners with constructor with constructor. The idea is to um, to work on different scales work on the scale of the overall building, uh, on the scale of the structural elements, where you have the changes. And um, as you may know, in surrogate model, uh, in fact, you, um, you estimate an approximation of the response mm -hmm. as you do not calculate everything, okay? 
So the idea is to have um, in, in your uh, basis uh, of experiments, numerical experiments, and also uh, in the basis of feedback of the constructor, enough mm. situations in order to have a good discretization of all the domain, uh, starting domain, and then the quantities of interest, that is the indicator in terms of time, of cost, and so on. So the idea is to try to um, cover a lot of possibilities locally, uh, because when you are carrying out uh, changes during uh, the construction, generally the changes are um, concerning uh, just uh, uh, local changes. It will not be okay, for example, we change the overall architecture. So it right. may be uh, adding uh, holes, um, moving some plates, and so on. So um, the idea in the design of experiments that is uh, the base of then the, the, all the calculation to generate the, the surrogate model in order to train the surrogate model is to work um, on a lot of possibilities trying to disc in discussing with constructor, with architect, uh, architects like, like EDF, for example, constructor like, like uh, EFAG is one of our partners, um, is try to uh, take benefit of what he has been considered in um, real, uh, in concrete um, nuclear uh, buildings recently uh, carried out. The, um, Bassam has exposed the example of the um, DUS uh, the, um, of, of EDF, we have that uh, that will be used. And also we, we will use, we'll take benefits of some feedback coming from uh, non-nuclear uh, construction sites where you, for some industrial building, you may have very close uh, situations. So then we will try to model uh, many possibilities take the feedback, use the feedback, use the experiments of experts that will say, okay, this we know that in this case, it has generated the time, that kind of delay, that kind of cost, et cetera, and we'll put that in the blender. And then for the local changes, uh, we will take benefit of, for example, a set of walls or uh, walls and slabs. Will these uh, um, add of holes in the changes that will be a part of the, you will have different surrogate models. In fact, you will have surrogate models that will dedicate it, will be dedicated to the, um, the big architecture uh, just to uh, try to uh, balance um, the consequences in terms of time, of cost, of um, big architecture options. And you will have also small uh, surrogate models that will be dedicated to embark uh, the consequences of local changes. Okay, that, that's the idea. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. So basically, collect all the lessons learned from the past and put them in the blender, you call it, and be ready uh, for those changes or challenges as they come up into doing construction. Thank you so much. I guess now uh, it, it's a, a common question that I, uh, or a common theme in all those presentations that I ran today. There's a lot of emphasis on digital engineering and digital twinning, and the the, uh, the benefits of that. So I got. Uh, one question for all the panelists. Uh, we all think that this is a great idea. I want to kind of hear uh, some of the challenges that you think will be uh, uh, facing uh, the uh, getting this the golden thread or the digital engineering or digitization. So if you can share with us some of those challenges that uh, you think that will be facing us as we are implementing these technologies so we are aware of this and aware of it and also the audience will be uh, uh, you know, able to understand those. I'll start from uh, with you, uh, Guem, if you don't mind, uh, to share with us maybe some of your thoughts about what could be one or two challenges facing the digital engineering and digitization of the entire uh, schedule, plant, construction, engineering, as you shared with us. One of the, the big challenges will be to, um, to introduce some evolution in the existing uh, formats uh, for example, in the BIM, in the BIM uh, uh, architecture, um, we have to, um, there, there are, in fact, it will be in different steps. I think that the first step will be, if I 
and I'm talking just about uh, C structure, um, the first step will be to uh, discuss with us, um, to put around the table and discuss then with all the actors, a uh, constructor, civil work designer, um, uh, owners, and to uh, cover, to try to cover all that you have to put in the, in the machine so that you can cover what is necessary. Uh, I mean, uh, for example, to add uh, some uh, evolution in the predefined attributes uh, within uh, the, um, the, 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 the beam. And I think that the other key challenge will be uh, the dialogue in between the different standards because if you try to make co-engineering, you have also to think about um, the dialogue between standards because the, the galleries that will do piping will not have the same load combinations. And uh, if you want to embark with a, a smart approach, um, the forces that are coming from piping or different systems, in fact, what is coming from all the SSC into the design of structure, structure to have something that is optimized. And then you have to rethink the, the, the different codes and to make them uh, capable of talking with each other in in smart way. I think that yeah. is the hardest uh, piece of yeah. that. Great answer. So uh, how, about we, how about you, Bassam, especially when you have the uh, SC walls are being manufactured offsite uh, where do you think that digital engineering, digital twinning will help in alignment of and also tolerances related to SC walls? And what could be one or two challenges that you, you see uh, for, for using digital twinning of digital engineering? Yeah, we, we have used BIM extensively on the project that I described. And, and frankly, uh, I don't think we could have managed without that it, it's really been an essential tool to what we've done in terms of communicating with the fabricator in terms of uh, ironing out, eliminating any clashes. Uh, we also experimented with the smart tags um, to uh, carry additional information on the module. So you know exactly what stage every module is at uh, in, its, in its life cycle. Um, we, we experimented with that to, to varying degrees of success. I think partly not because there's anything wrong with it, but because it was requiring some double takes from the fabricator. They were used to doing and recording information in a certain way, and, and suddenly they were having to do it twice. Um, so I think stre streamlining the uh -huh. um, operations so that uh, you're doing things only once and then the whole design team, uh, the whole project team rather has access to the information uh, is, is very important. And one thing I would add about using this sort of modular construction technology is th the involvement, and I think this came up earlier in the KHMP presentation as well, the involvement of everybody in the project team right from the outset is essential. Without that, it just doesn't work. The, the, the input that you get from the main contractor, from the fabricator into the design process is absolutely crucial to then uh, designing something that is going to be manufactured in a way that's going to be constructed on site. Thank you. Great. Uh, uh, couldn't agree more. The agreement has to be from the get-go that say, hey, we're going to do this in this, this methodology, so all need to be uh, uh, contributing to the input and design. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Johns, how about uh, in manufacturing? Actually, the digital engineering, digital twinning came out of manufacturing. So this is the, and we in civil structural and structural uh, components, we kind of adopting this kind of technology. So uh, what are some of the challenges or maybe lessons learned that you can share with us, uh, especially you mentioned this golden thread. I like this term uh, that you can share with us for uh, big construction or mega projects like nuclear power plant construction. Well, um, I think I, I'd sum this up very quickly uh, that the it's it's down to culture at the end of the day, as well as um, obviously having the truth of data, you know, the data, the source of truth. We, we've used it in aerospace um, in my previous life with Rolls Royce. We've used it to look at um, monitoring and doing all the necessary pieces, but it really relies on the effectiveness and truth of the amount of data stroke 
um, the quality of that data, the fidelity of that data going in, it, and it needs continuously updating. And we talk about it as being a, the panacea to all our solutions, and it will actually help. But there's this, there's always a yin and a yang. Cybersecurity um, yes. and the security of data uh, is going to be absolutely fundamental. And I wouldn't expect our regulators to uh, expect anything else from us to prove that that source of data is coming is truthful. Um, the second thing is how do you calibrate that? What is the calibration model that our regulators would have to use to make sure that data is absolutely truthful? We can't just jump from design by rule to design by analysis um, overnight. And the other thing that we need to consider is the data can actually allow us to think about extrapolating to a certain degree. Someone, I think Willem mentioned uh, surrogate data. W whilst that's pretty good on, on, on the primary island components, um, it, won't, it won't wash in my opinion at this moment without having that truthful data there to prove it. So scalability and equipment qualification at size is absolutely imperative. But if we can take a lot of that out in the beginning by building these models, it will be far more cost effective, far more uh, impressive on our scheduling and more tolerable on our scheduling. And um, once again, we'll build this up over, over many, many years, but we must build our cybersecurity with it. All right, thank you. Great, great addition. Uh, uh, Ashley, how about you? You actually shared that you had a, a, a success story with your digital engineering, especially for test beds. Uh, so maybe you can share one or two uh, key success stories or maybe items and then maybe one challenge that you will all face and you you know work out the solution to overcome it. Absolutely. Thanks, Hassan. Um, we've found it to be a very successful way to communicate with our innovator partners, right? So so communicating between the laboratory and the private sector um, is is very much enhanced by using digital engineering tools. So that's been a big success. Um, for us, the biggest challenge really is, is not technical so much as cultural. So um, needing to, to transition all of the existing um, processes and, and approaches to managing information towards digital engineering requires um, participation from a lot of different groups within the lab and within different um, organizations. And, and that's where we've run into the most challenges. We're working through them, but, but those seem to be the hardest. Got it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Great answer. Uh, so I think uh, great presentations, great answers, great discussions. I wish I had more time. I have really, really questions for those presentations, but I'm just going to leave you with this. I think for us to be successful for the next generation of nuclear power plant, you all agree that what you presented today, that we really need to have, we need to think differently. We need to you know, employ all those technologies that we can, we can use and we need to think differently of how we are going to construct nuclear power plants, because you can perfect the nuclear side of things, uh, but unless you can prove you can construct it on time and schedule, that's yeah, you know, that's going to be really important. So Antonio is back to you, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to moderate the session. So thank you, thank you everybody, thank you all the panelists, Hassan, you did great. It was not easy to move through all these technical aspects, so. Uh, you did great and also thank you all the panelists for the insights on 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 all these technologies so with this we are a little bit behind of schedule but we did it quite well i think uh so now i would like with this to close the event today just to remind you that we will be resuming with the other two sessions tomorrow uh at 2 p.m and this will be an opportunity really to move towards opportunities based on smrs new uh, deployment pathways um, that new, more innovative designs can unlock. We will also bring uh, regulators and code and standard organization because it's really important to see how it is possible to create that environment uh, to really have accelerate the codification of, of these standards so that we, we can have a faster uh, deployment. So with this, uh, I really would like to close this session today and see you tomorrow. Have a nice evening.